They're going to start it for me. All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We'll wait for the mics to get turned on, but if everyone can uh, join us now, it's 7.30 on this March 15th. A uh, couple of ground rules to go over before we start this committee of the whole. The floor will be open to the audience for 20 minutes to address the city council mm -hmm. on matters that are on this evening's agenda. Uh, we ask that persons wishing to address the city council keep their comments to five minutes in length. Comments must be addressed to the city council as a whole. And of course, profanity will not be used or tolerated in any form during these conversations or with the public comment. We do have six items on this evening's agenda and for the sake of time and efficiency why don't we just dive right in with the first item of the fire hall eatery the presentation on 3111 meadow fire station redevelopment proposal and for this joelle and when you're ready the floor is yours thank you mayor and council it's great to be back in this format <laughs> i was just talking to folks tonight that i think i did this format twice before covid kicked in and i haven't been back since so um, we're very happy tonight to present the um, co-action team and their proposal for Fire Hall, um, which is a redevelopment of the property that the city owns, the fire station property that the city owns on Meadow Drive. Um, the focus is to introduce council and the community to this concept. Um, and as we all know, this property has been for sale for quite some time. So we're looking to get some feedback from you, give you an opportunity to ask questions, and ultimately try to get some direction from council as to whether this is a project you'd like to see us continue to spend time with this team to move forward. Um, I did include in your agenda packet a lot of summary information about the proposal as well as some of the um, site planning issues and zoning issues that we initially identified. That's not our purpose tonight. Our purpose tonight is to uh, let this team present their pr uh, project so in a second, I'm going to introduce uh, Samantha Doro from the co-action team, and she is joined by three other members of her team that, are, that have been working on the amendments to the proposal. And then also, I'm sure she'll announce that we have two members from Leaky Keg here as well. So if there are questions for any of those folks, I'm um, sure sh they'll provide you with an opportunity to ask those towards the end. So I'm going to turn it over to Samantha and let her make the proposal for Fire Hall. It's nice to see everyone. Thank you for your time tonight. Um, I wanted to start by just introducing ourselves briefly. So um, my name is Samantha Doro. I grew up here in the Northwest suburbs. This is my home. Um, and I am a entrepreneur. I actually started in the Young Entrepreneurs Academy at, in Arlington Heights, which has grown to the rest of the Northwest suburbs. A really cool program. Um, and so I'm excited today to bring before you this idea of the fire hall. Um, and before I get started, I want to let Arthur uh, Wang introduce himself, and then Selena McFarland. Hello, thank you for having us. My name is Arthur Wang. I've spent the last 15 years or so of my life uh, in a combination of food and beverage and uh, real estate. Uh, most recently, I worked for Marriott International. Right now, I'm working for Century 21 Affiliated, which is the largest franchise holder in the world for Century 21. Uh, specializing in development and redevelopment of hotels uh, for about five years at First Hospitality Group. So very intimately knowledgeable about the development of real estate, especially repurposing. Uh, yeah, I think that my passion is with food and beverage because I think that brings together communities. I think that this is the future in terms of kind of creating the anchor commercial area for the downtown Rolling Meadows. So I think that this is kind of a cool project. I think that uh, the idea of a food hall has always been very interesting to me because I think that the idea of collaborating and creating a coalition of small businesses is like um, beneficial for the community overall. So that's a little bit on me. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Celine McFarland and I have been within the uh, IT industry for about six years now. So I've worked in a variety of different industries such as financial institutions, food storage, and currently I'm actually working in retail uh, sector. So I'm hoping to bring all of that IT knowledge specifically about data and software uh, to the fire hall and to co-action as a whole. So thank you. All right, so now we're going to jump into the presentation. 
fully. Oh, not sure if the clicker is working. Oh, maybe it's just delayed. Okay, so that was our uh, brief introduction about ourselves. Um, basically, you know, it's a long meeting today. I think we can, if we were to boil the fire hall project down into like four really important tenants, it'd be collaboration, cooperation, community, and growth. So I think this project is really set up to, um, well, I should start from the beginning in case not everybody knows. So um, we plan to own the building and rent out tenant booths to independent vendors. So one of which being Leaky Keg, who's here with us today. Um, so they would run their own business completely separate from us within our building. So within that space, we hope to foster this collaboration and cooperation between businesses like Leaky Keg, an independent charcuterie board booth, a um, cocktail booth, a Thai restaurant, a bakery and coffee shop, um, different individual booths like that. So really, we want to transform an old community center into a new community gathering place and center for people to come enjoy. Um, I think the idea of a fire hall is so exciting because when you have a diverse group of friends and a diverse group of people, it, it's nice to know you can go somewhere where everybody has options and everyone's going to be able to get the type of food or drink that they're excited about. Um, so there we go. So like I mentioned, um, one of the main ways our business is going to make money is through rent. So the rent will be paid, again, by small businesses like Leaky Keg, like restaurants. Um, the beverage component is going to be from the cocktail bar that we will run and operate ourselves. Professional services is a really interesting part of this business. Um, what we wanted to focus on was letting people do what they're passionate about and not having them get bogged down by what they're not passionate about. So like Selena brought up, she has a lot of experience in the IT sector. Not everybody loves IT and running point of sale service and making sure all those pieces of the business are well put together. Same with accounting. Not everybody loves doing the numbers, filing the taxes. Um, so that's gonna be another portion that we're able to alleviate and offer those services to the small businesses that wanna focus on their passion, like brewing great craft beer or producing a great biscotti or croissant. Um, another a service we plan to provide is a, a centralized catering manager. Um, so that catering manager, we would pay the salary out of our fund and then they would get a 7% commission on any business that chose to use their services. Um, they'd, they'd pay a 7% commission on whatever business was stirred up by that catering manager. Bear with me, click oh. All right. I think it is only going forward, not backwards. So. There we go. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah, she's going. Yeah, she's. All right. Um, part of our business model is we want to test the concept. Uh, we don't want to build out a multi-million dollar building all at once and then hope that people enjoy the concept and want to come join us in our space. Um, so we've broken it down into three phases. We feel it's the most responsible thing to do. So in phase one, we're really just restoring and bringing to life the first floor. That's where the six vendor booths will be located. The seating, we're also going to make sure there's adequate parking for that first floor. Um, yeah, those are, the, those are the big steps of phase one, is just to get the first floor of the fire station open. Um, part of the design elements is we do want to keep a lot of what used to be, I don't know if I'm saying it right, but Fogarty Fire Station historically. Um, we want to keep those big overhead doors. We want to keep the unfinished, uh, we want to finish, like polish the concrete, but leave that aesthetic there because, again, it's about transforming an existing community center into a revitalized version of itself. Um, so 
that would be the design element of the first floor. As discussed, um, parking is one of the things that will be done in phase one. Um, there is with the parking shown. So we've really, um, our construction partner, John, has really worked closely with the building department to try to figure out the best way we can maximize all of those parking spaces. Uh, we would love to have some more patio space, but um, we're trying to do our best to work with the constraints that we have and um, meet the city's needs. Um, so that will be a big part of phase one. In phase two, if phase one is successful, we're going to expand um, the dining space and the operating space into that second floor. Um, so that will effectively double our operating and dining space. Um, an important thing that we want to do in phase two is kind of separate uh, the atmospheres, if you will. Um, we'd like to keep the first floor super family friendly. Um, family oriented and then the second floor is going to be more of a, a, a adult experience i guess that's where the cocktail bar and the uh, leaky keg the brewery component is going to be located um, so we want this to be a place where people want to come hang out and spend time there's going to be bago there's going to be games vintage uh, video games bocce ball stuff like that we want to make it a really inviting place that people want to come out and spend time at um, and we also want to allow people the distinction between the two environments. If that's something that's they're not interested in, they'll be able to stay on the first floor and partake in the food. Um, another thing that's important about the second floor, though, is we plan to be incredibly active in the community. Um, so we, we want to host plenty of like charity events and community get-togethers. And the second floor will allow us that space while still remaining open to the public. Um, to host events and to get the community together and have larger gatherings. As part of phase three, we really want to tie in and focus on those outdoor spaces um, that might be pretty rudimentary in phase one. So in phase one, we just plan to have picnic tables with umbrellas. Um, in phase three, we want to go back and spend some more time on that, give it a roof for the hot summer months, do some nice lighting, some fans, some heating, so that it'll be tenable, not just for the few short months in Chicago that we have nice weather, um, but for hopefully the majority of three seasons. Um, as far as what you would see on opening day, um, Leaky Keg would be there, a coffee bar and bakery, a cocktail bar, a charcuterie booth that does wine, cheese, meats, and wine pairing, um, and then a Thai restaurant. So that is what you could look forward to seeing on opening day. And then obviously, if opening day goes well, um, some of those components get moved up to the second floor. That'll open up some space for some additional restaurant booths. So we're really excited to gauge the community's interest and see what they would like to see there. Um, in the beginning of this discussion, we got asked what cooperative catering, catering meant. So we wanted just to put a slide in here to highlight what that means to us. And again, one of the main ideas of this business is coming together and offering scale that these individual businesses will not have on their own. Um, so it might be very expensive for a small business to hire a catering manager or have just one point of sale system. So this is something that we feel like we can come together as a group and offer a far discounted rate to because we'll have many businesses utilizing those services and helping pay for those services. So again, to reiterate what cooperative catering means to us is that we would have one catering manager for the multiple restaurants within the space and they would all get to utilize and pay for their share pro rata which makes more sense to us than them each having their individual um, catering managers and the salaries and you know health insurance that comes with that so as part of our um, as part of our presentation and as part of us pondering um, if this is the right space for us. We did some market analysis and basically we made concentric circles around the fire hall, lo fire hall's location and then identified what food and beverage restaurants and outlets there already are in those spaces. Um, so 
you can kind of see we did a breakdown within a mile there are only six restaurants um of which it of which they were not the ones that had the most reviews and the most interaction within rolling meadows um those were further out in those concentric circles um so we point this out because we're excited to be you know hopefully a huge component there and be very involved in the community and uh, we've identified an opportunity for us and possibly a need for you guys um to you know give the consumers what they're looking for and give them that outlet that's nearby that they can walk to and bike to in the summer months we know there's a lot of development in that area so we hope to capture some foot business as well as <coughs> passerbys And then just as a proof of concept, we wanted to give some examples of where this is already being done and where it's being done very successfully. So there's some examples here. Um, I think all the board members got uh, the printouts so you can read a little bit about um, these different markets. The, the last one on the list, Broadway Food Hall, Arthur was uh, involved in. So it's just a nice thing to know that we've done things like this before. So in closing, uh, we're really excited to the prospective opportunity to join the city of Rolling Meadows and their goal to revitalize that area and bring an outlet to the consumers that they're excited to go to. Um, if you guys have any questions at this point. Yeah, thank you, Samantha, Selena, and Arthur for the presentation on Fire Hall. This would be the time for council to ask any questions or address any concerns or share any comments. Alderman Bassessi and then O'Brien. So, so my, you know, uh, excellent uh, presentation. Um, the uh, uh, my biggest concern, and I'm sure the plan, planning and zoning commission's biggest concern will be the parking. Uh, I'm sure it's a concern of yours as well. With phase one, I think the parking will most likely be ample to to cover that. But as you go through the phases. Um, where would you be looking to get additional parking? Absolutely, thanks for the question. So uh, first, I, I wanna point out that we view that as a good problem to have. If we're successful and we're growing and we're building and we have the need for more parking, that means that the consumers are really happy with the fact that we're there. Um, and actually, we've already started the process of looking for additional parking. So we've been in contact with the church directly behind um, to gauge if they would be interested in leasing us some of their parking spaces. They were not super interested, so now we are addressing other small businesses in that area. Um, there's the Comet Custard right there that is not open during the winter months, so that'll probably be the next avenue we go down. Um, we also inquired very early on about the vacant Taco Bell uh, right next door, and we were told it's really hard for people in the city to get in contact um with the owners of that land but we are very open to exploring all of the possibilities and doing whatever we can to alleviate those parking struggles so i mean in looking at your parking diagram here yeah um are the parking spaces i know how it's currently configured mm -hmm. you got like a, a piece of land next to the fire station and then you have that little, uh, I don't know if it categorizes as a road or whatever, between the church and the fire station. There's parking spaces along that road um, that um, butt up against the firehouse property. Are those parking spaces part of that plan or is that plan just for that to be developed? Yeah. Right so there. my understanding is that's an easement. easement. Um, I don't know. Is it? Yeah, that's a dedicated that's easement this that was done years ago uh, mm -hmm. for the benefit, I believe, of the church. Um, um, that that um, is a dedicated easement that I, I believe was done in 1989, mm -hmm. um, and for the benefit of the church. But we've explored sharing that because. Our busy time will not be their busy time. Uh, we off, we actually uh, looked at possibly not having the fire hall open on uh, Sundays until maybe noon 
where that way they can utilize that space and actually probably share some of our parking uh, during the church hours uh, in exchange for yeah. that. But, uh, but unfortunately, um, over the years, um, the property that was originally dedicated to the firehouse um, had been granted easements on the, both the south side and the west side, making it more challenging today. Okay, yeah, and, and that would that would be probably a good good solution because um, I do know because I am actually I'll, in all fairness I am a member of that church. Okay, uh, the uh, we uh, like the church. The we like to share <laughs> the uh, those those spots aren't a hundred percent necessary except sometimes on Sunday, mm -hmm. especially when you get into you know the Christmas time and sure. In Easter sure. and that, and then there's a handful of events throughout the year. Uh, so, so being closed, particularly Sunday, I do know that there's multiple congregations mm -hmm. there. Um, so I'm not sure about the size of some of the other ones, but uh, um, I appreciate your uh, okay. You thinking about that that whole thing, and the, and the Sunday hours is really. Uh, a good thing. Yeah. So if you look on the opening day page, I can attempt to get there with this remote who's not my friend. Oh my. Okay. Well, um, so if you, you take a look on Sunday, we don't open until noon. Um, and that was in an effort to, you know, like we said, the tenants of this business are to cooperate, collaborate, grow together. Um, and we're very willing and open to doing that. And this is just one of those, one of those scenarios in which I feel like it's best for the community to all cooperate. Yeah, and I would just say continue to work with them because I do know they have other congregations there and I think one of them actually starts around noon. Okay, yeah. So um, we can continue those conversations. So, okay, thank you. Yep. That was my main concern that I was asked by yeah. residents. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I know you're trying to be considerate when addressing your questions to Samantha. Um, but don't forget to speak into the mic so that way it can be picked up and recorded yeah, as well. With <laughs> yeah, if you can <laughs> turn your head and keep the mic nearby, that'll help. Alderman O'Brien. Great. Thank you, Mr. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Certainly uh, uh, in favor of an uh, entity like this. Just a, a handful of questions based on the write-up, too. Am I understanding correctly, like, phase one, certainly get the first floor. But I think in the write-up it was saying any of the cooking or prep areas would be on the second floor. So I know for like a charcuterie board and things like that, you probably don't need kitchen wear other right. than refrigeration. But for like the Thai restaurant, the coffee, is that going to be on the second floor, even though in it's phase one on the first floor? So what we want to do, again, it's about gaining scale with all these small businesses coming together and cooperating together that they wouldn't have alone. So like, for example, we plan to have one central dishwashing station that will be in phase two up on the second okay. floor. Um, and so, uh, like a lot of restaurants in the city, right, they'll have sometimes their prep area or their dishwashing stations also on other floors. And then at the non busy times, they'll, sure. you know, get their dishes back there, stuff like that. So, that allows us to maximize the customer facing space that we have. So, yeah, absolutely. In phase two, when we're able to relocate some of that prep work, um, some of the dishwashing stations, stuff like that, up to the second floor, it will open up the possibility for even more booths on the first floor. Great, thanks. Um, just a, a couple of ones, because I know you're clearly working with staff, so any variations, variances, and things like that, park handle, that's in great hands. Um, for the professional services, that's roughly, I know these are total estimate numbers, that's yes. roughly 25% of your income. Yep. So I'm assuming, is that going to be offered services offered to non tenants or tenants only? Like the six booths. Or is your plan to possibly go down the street and offer your services for this portion to a non-tenant of the fire hall? Yeah, a little bit of both. So one of the first components that we're um, bringing on is like an event coordinator. Um, uh, so the event coordinator, yeah, we absolutely could lease out to other, you know, I know Rep's Place has events all the time. Right. You know, somebody who's in this industry and is experienced with photographing and promoting restaurant events. Uh, we think there's definitely a need outside of our own business. Um, along with that, our goal for these small businesses is that they outgrow us. It's not the hope that they stay sure. with us this entire time. The hope is that they outgrow us. 
and we plan to maintain those relationships while they grow. So I think we'll continue to build a customer base and yeah, it, it won't just be the six booths to answer your question. Great, and then that actually kind of goes with my second to last question is clearly based on all the great research you've done, there's interest in Thai, a coffee place, the, or the bar, things like, are there interests, like do you have potential tenants to go in? Because that actually kind of goes to my last question is my only concern, and I don't want to speak for the whole council, but what I've heard from residents too, since that place has been vacant, we don't want it to be sold and then it sits for a year. Yeah. Like, I didn't see in your phase timeline that, hey, phase one, you're estimating to be six months and you'll either make a go, no go decision at the six month mark to continue to phase two. Do you have any ballpark in timing wise? I know it's tough to do, um, cause it's a new venture for your group as well, but I think that's my main concern is that if this deal does move forward, that that's one of the last places in downtown yeah. that we don't want it to be sold. And then regrettably, you clearly have as much of a vested interest as we do because it's your financials. It's yeah. certainly our city, but you've got a vested interest as well from a financial perspective that we want everybody to be successful. That's just some angst I've heard from residents that we don't want it to be built or sold and then nothing come because we've regrettably had that in other areas, not necessarily on the strip, but we've had it around the city. Yeah, absolutely. So I think you hit the nail on the head. It would be in our worst interest to drag our feet. So okay. six months is about the rough timeline. We want to give it enough time to make sure mm -hmm. that the um, that the interest is lasting and not fleeting. But the other thing that we want to do within that six months that we wouldn't want to rush into say three is gain the community's perspective, ask the questions, have them fill out the surveys, um, and really put some thought into what they would like to see on the second floor and how they want the first floor you know, rearranged with that. We're gonna be moving two bo booths upstairs along with stations. So we're gonna have some booths open and we wanna make sure that we're picking the right booths. And we've been working with Martha um, you know, to try to identify some Rolling Meadows business people that already have a business here and are looking for this next step to try to grow their business. Um, so we hope to keep that relationship going. Great, Thank, that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman O'Brien. Um, I wanna stick to that point just for a moment because I've heard that same or sim similar sentiment shared about the, the long-term viability. Um, I very much appreciate the idea. I think it's extremely creative and a lot of me is for it. Um, but you did mention when you were moving from phase one in the presentation to phase two uh, after the projections, you did you did state if if phase one is successful, then we'll move on to phase two. And it, the if is the part that that perked my ears up. And I just want to know if if you guys are monitoring the growth of the progress in phase one and it's not meeting uh, your expectations, what are the contingency plans or, or what are you going to do to adapt versus abandon? Yeah, absolutely. So we are going to be very financially and emotionally and work-wise committed to that building at that point. Um, but it would need it would mean that we need to reevaluate wh what we've done up until that point and pivot, right? So it wouldn't make sense to launch into the second floor while we're kind of finding our footing. Um, so that is actually one of the most important reasons that Selena is on this team is to give us the data to make these data driven decisions because it's possible that like leaky keg is knocking it out of the park and everyone is there from say, 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. and loving it, but the Thai restaurant is failing, which is a problem to us because they're part of our business. We want to make sure everyone is successful and everyone is, you know, doing well. So I, to answer your question, I think it's responsible to say if, because if we're going, if we're full speed ahead, mm -hmm. this is going to work out. There's not going to be any problems. It's just not realistic, you know, running any business. We're going to run into these issues, these snags, and we plan to address them and move forward very quickly. Yeah, and I agree with you that it's responsible to y use th the word if in the scenario. Um, but I'm just curious to know if you're running these if and then scenarios, if you do have contingency plans in mind now, or you're going to call them as an audible when the time arrives. Yeah, so there's there's already things that we're doing to kind of let me make sure I understand your question fully. So uh, you're asking if there's a contingency plan right now. What I'm, what I'm saying is that you're, you're going into this endeavor mm -hmm. and you have it broken down in a phased approach mm -hmm. and you begun with phase one and you presented the three phases to us as a council. Right. But as you are implementing each phase and you are monitoring the growth, the progress or stagnation, right. uh, hopefully it's 
progress it's the we former so. um that you also are keeping in mind that if worst case scenarios are arriving that you're developing some sort of contingency plans or that you have some in mind already that you you can use to kind of shift your business model so that it stays viable and doesn't just end at phase one yeah absolutely so i i we're fairly confident based on like our market research um that it's not a matter of if restaurants and beverage components will be successful it's a matter of which ones so i guess the best answer to your question is we're going to be evaluating that we're going to know it sooner than anyone based on the data and analytics we have planned to have in place and we're just going to do what most businesses do reinvest more money into whatever is going well and funnel money away from what's not we don't plan the if isn't if stagnation is happening how do we exit? So your model is built on, on following the trends from the data that you accumulate or aggregate from the real-time experience of your patrons? Yeah, it's built on listening to our consumers. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Alderman Bud Matz, Veneziano, then Mikhail. So I'll ask the awkward question. How deep are your pockets? That you, How long would you be willing to work in phase one and keep it going and, and keep pivoting until how long? How long would you be able to do that before you determine that you'd have to really make a large pivot? Yeah, so um, as we explained, Arthur and I both have accounting backgrounds. Um, I appreciate the question. It's a bit too vague to answer because how bad are we struggling? Are some venues successful and some aren't? What I would need to know exactly what that meant in order to tell you how long we could sustain that and different avenues we could take to sustain that because it's it's going to depend like if we go to a lender the lender is going to want to know exactly what's going right exactly what's going wrong in order for them to make any decisions so it's really hard to answer without those specifics like are we 70 percent going well and 30 percent of the businesses are not doing well i'm just talking in terms of not going to a lender and your own your your corporation asset how how long can you sustain this because uh, it seems to me to be a, a concept and 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 I, I love new concepts and I'm all in favor of it I'm just trying to just trying to make sure that you've got the financial wherewithal to push through if it gets a little bit tough the first winter yeah we wouldn't be here if we didn't have the ability to do that because we'd be putting ourselves in a huge risk I mean, I understand you guys too w would with the building, um, but uh, yeah, if we couldn't sustain, we, d we don't expect it to be booming on day one. Like that's not the plan. The plan is that there's gonna be, you know, some growth. Um, yeah, I'm, unfortunately, I don't think I have enough spe specifics about that to answer your question at this moment. Okay, thank you. Alderman Veneziano. Thank you. So um, I will ask the big elephant in the room. Um, being in our ward, I'm sure you've heard that um, we've considered many options to go there and we cannot and absolutely will not accept any kind of housing there. Mm -hmm. So being said, I think that's a quick answer and that's why we've had many proposals for that. So if, and I think that would be a quick solution if phase one is not as um, profitable or successful as anticipated. Um, is that on your horizon as in a contingency option? No, it's all being zoned commercial. So it, I think it, we would have to come, my understanding is we'd have to come back and ask you to rezone it for us, which has been understood loud and clear from the beginning that that is not what you'd like to do. So no. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alderman McHale. Yeah, um, I had a quick question. Is this a brand new venture for for you, the three of you, the Coaction Corporation? Have you done any other um, anything business wise together before? Yes, we have. Okay. Um, not within Coaction Corporation. So we're uh, yeah different entities. So right now we it, we invest in residential real estate together, along with have other um, property management ventures. Yeah, business like that. So you have, um, here's my here's my concern. Okay. <laughs> is that you're gonna buy the firehouse mm -hmm. and 
I mean, we're talking about an old firehouse. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to rehab this. We're kind of talking about this concept. Like, it's already, like, we just got to throw some floors down and kind of move move forward from there. My concern is um, kind of pivoting off of uh, Alderman Bud Matz here is that if you come into an issue within this firehouse and you're putting all your capital into, you know, fixing the problem that may have arisen or you realize this isn't exactly what we were looking for, um, and then we're we're stuck, and we're stuck mm -hmm. with a half-built something that sits. So can you speak to that at all? Yeah, so we have a construction budget. Um, John is our construction budget, and there's actually a generous contingency built into the construction budget. So we're planning for something to go wrong and for us to need to spend more money than we had expected in the beginning. Right, and, and we, we, I mean, we would want you to be just as successful for the city as well. So um, that's just that's just one of my my concerns. And then you were saying that your uh, time frame um, from let's say you close. What is what are you thinking? Yeah, I think um, John might be able to speak to that better or uh, correct me if I'm incorrect. But my understanding was like six to eight months for phase one. Yes, but depending on the start date, uh, the. Uh, when we originally uh, looked at just the building itself, um, now um, in talking with Joel and in the group, um, the parking area needs to be developed on day one. Obviously, it's weather dependent. This is not the time to be doing asphalt. Um, so we have to maybe see what happens with the market in terms of when that uh, comes online. Um, construction pricing is, is very sketchy right now as well. So. Um, the budget that I prepared is um, 30 days old. We hope that, you know, uh, we're not going to be in for any more surprises. But I've been in the construction business for 35 years. Uh, the budget that I gave them is a real budget. And um, I've been through that building three times now. I feel very confident. I mean, it's built like a uh, bomb shelter. Okay. Um, <laughs> very well built, obviously. We're going to embrace the history of the building and try to bring it into the uh, new millennium. Uh, it's it's got some dated issues, but it's it's very charming. So uh, we know what we're in for. Uh, the elevator was something that we had thought to put off. Uh, whether that's in phase one or phase, it'll be identified. But obviously, if you don't have to access the second floor, we can maybe do the infrastructure and and delay that. But um, most of the improvements will be done. They're going to know their financial situation before they open. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I think okay. that's it. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, or concerns from the council while they're up at the podium? Thank you. I think Thank it's you. been very helpful. Um, Joellen, is there more guidance or request and direction you'd like from us? Yeah, again, I just um, thank you to the teams for presenting. This is a, an exciting project, and there are some details to work through. Our um, request to council is for direction to continue to negotiate with them with the intention that we'll work on a development agreement. So a lot of you had questions related to timing and cost and, and the what if scenarios, all of which could potentially be included as terms in the development agreement. So I took some pretty good notes. We'll have conversations with them about how that development agreement um, would be put together and it's a package deal. You know, we're gonna have to package that and, and progress that through the process at the same time that we're doing zoning and, and sale documents as well. So it, it's rather complex. We can um, come back to council with some updates if you'd like. Um, but at this point, I think we're just looking for direction on whether this is a concept that we want to move forward on and, and continue to invest staff resources with. Okay, perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's a wonderful concept. I'm interested and excited about the opportunities. Um, definitely would like to see the conversations move forward a little bit more meticulously in the details, but this is for the council to make that determination. Um, straw vote, show of hands of those in favor of having staff continue the conversation on this development and possible opportunity. It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, that'll uh, conclude this first item, and we'll move on to the second, which is with Director Horn, and this is about our refuse automation initiative. Looking forward to the updates on this. Thank you, Mayor.
presentation for me on yep. this one. Um, so, as the council, uh, <laughs> as the council will recall, uh, we um, or the city council renewed a contract with Flood Brothers, who is our recycling contractor for five years. As part of that proposal, they gave us a uh, um, cost per month fee related to providing recycling containers for every resident in the community. Uh, a decision was made that we proceed with uh, uh, refuse automation, which is uh, which uh, has a variety of benefits both to um, our employees and uh, uh, residents. Um, the, the great critter complaint uh, that you all get uh, will hopefully uh, go away in the near future. But this was an opportunity to really uh, bring to you this item, make sure you understand what our process is moving forward, and, and kind of a, give you an opportunity for a no, uh, go, no go um, status on this. So um, I'm just gonna walk through a few of the uh, um, uh, key dates that are important to us meeting our timeline. Um, with me today are um, uh, Public Works Operations Superintendent Bill Suchecki uh, to answer any operational questions from the city side, um, as well as both Michael and Kevin Flood from Flood Brothers, um, who will be available for questions as the subject matter experts to some of the information I'm going to present tonight that's slightly different than information we presented in the past. Um, excuse me. Uh, the first key date that we have to focus on is April 1st. Um, we've talked with the Vehicle Replacement Committee about the need to order our equipment that outfits our trucks. Um, uh, when we talked to the vendors about a month ago, uh, they said that it's possible we would have our equipment and supplies by the end of April. Now they're talking about the end of June. So if we don't get it by the, end of, uh, by the beginning of April, if we push it off till May, I have concerns about us being able to start it in the summer based on some of our timelines. Um, just so you all know, that item is proposed to come to you on the May, uh, excuse me, March 22nd City Council meeting agenda. <clears throat> um, I think I can recall uh, our budget number last year was 115,000. That cost has gone up about five to 7,000 just based on material costs. Uh, and eight months of waiting. So um, uh, that, that uh, program uh, or that is important to get that done so we can get that equipment here tested out uh, for about a month, train our drivers on the equipment to be able to um, um, be proficient on it when we actually go live. Uh, the go live we're proposing is August 1st which gives us about three and a half months of social, uh, social media outreach program. We're going to use social media, the community sign, newsletters. Um, uh, we are going to do a direct mailing. I believe I put that in the packet. I've worked with uh, Michael in getting that direct mailing done. Um, we're gonna do everything we can to get that information out there. Um, uh, and so those are the, the uh, oh, and the last, obviously the last mm. important date, um, is everything okay? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, the last important date uh, that we have is the uh, week of July 25th through the 29th. Um, in talking with Flood Brothers, they have a lot of experience in doing these transitional changeovers um, when, when vendors switch communities. Um, what we are planning on doing, and Bill will correct me if I'm wrong, is each day we're going to um, um, pick a section of the community, a, a uh, garbage route, and uh, those recycling containers will be dropped off that day. Um, your recycling container, when you bring it down, will be left at the curb. Our public works employees will follow Flood Brothers uh, employees and be putting a sticker um, as is seen on the example containers in the room that covers up the recycling guidelines and says trash only. Um, our, our, one of our uh, foremans, our street foremans, did a lot of research and was able to get, I think it'll cost like $3,500 to get stickers. It takes about 15 seconds to put one sticker on. So very efficient, really a, a quick deal. And we'll do each, um, each zone, each day, each route, each day of that week. That way, by August 1st, 
on a Monday, everybody starts anew. They bring each one of their containers down, one on each side of the driveway, and we're automated. So that's the, that's the goal. Um, the one part of the presentation that I need to make you aware of is in speaking with uh, Kevin, Michael, and the rest of the flood team, uh, we determined that it was most prudent to deliver only 65 gallon containers at this time. Um, I, it was very easy to convince me of that um, because I have recently gone through, uh, experienced two different communities that I'm very close to, one being the one I live in, the other one being the one I used to work at. Um, the community I live in delivered 95 gallons to everybody regardless of house size, regardless of resident age, regardless of anything, and they got hundreds and hundreds of complaints. Um, the community I used to work in did the um, boutique style government where they let every resident pick everything about their container. I was seeing social media posts for two months after apologizing for the problems that resulted from that. What we found, and, and through the guidance of the flood, flood family, the flood uh, vendor, is 65 gallon um, containers for recycling is the industry standard. It is the container size that people currently use. And what we would propose is that we continue to use that size. What residents need to understand is um, when it comes to your refuse, you know, uh, the garbage, the city picked up, um, anything that doesn't go in the container gets put at the curb, we're gonna take it anyways. We've also been assured by Michael and Kevin that the same holds true with the recycling. If you have a cardboard box or a bag full of cans or whatever that can't fit in the container, you can put it down next to it, they're gonna take it. Um, in the very rare event that you would need an extra container after you've shown that you're continually doing that, then you will be able to contact Flood. Um, it would be a cost to the resident specifically and they will provide you another 65 gallon container. Obviously because it's the industry standard, that's what they have supply and stock in. Um, uh, when it comes to our 35 gallon containers, uh, I was reminded by um, uh, Bill and his team that almost all of our seniors either already have a 35 gallon container or they're using a 65 and and receiving the backdoor service so that impact to senior citizens that we originally talked about is really not going to be there um, our concerns regarding the size of the toters um, uh, uh, um, these things uh, that we we just talked about um, are, are really the driving factors as to why I felt comfortable coming to you tonight and telling you that I think this is the wisest decision. Um, in talking to Bill, uh, when it comes to refuse, some people do like a larger cart. Um, we are not opposed to building an inventory of that in the future, but right now because of the costs of the containers that we're currently going to um, um, cover the costs of for the residents, we want to let that program flush itself out for a while before we start investing into larger size containers. So um, I have, uh, this presentation is kind of a two part. Uh, that's really all I have regarding the operation side of it. Um, both Kevin and Michael and, and actually all three, Bill are available to answer any questions you might have regarding that operation schedule plan um, uh, for our refuse automation. Alderman O'Brien. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Just one question, um, and I'm sure any of you experts can answer it, is it just came to light in, in your presentation there, Director Horn, is obviously refuse being in both sides, I know you said opposite sides of the driveway. So a lot of our driveways, as we all know, are back to back, right to each other. We have a small strip of grass or something in between, but at the bottom at the apron, the driveways connect. 
So I'm guessing it's because of how the automation's going to, like the calipers, probably the wrong word, but the, the grips, the hooks, yeah. is that we just have to make sure they're spaced enough because I can put yeah. my refuse on the left side, but my right side is at my neighbor's left-hand side. It's really just so the grabbers can grab it. Okay. I, I, and, and I can... I, I Do you like those words, the grabbers? The I'm grabbers. sure there's a, a technical <laughs> term, but works, grabber yeah. works? Okay. <laughs> I, I, uh, I actually can answer this one because... Um, uh, uh, Flood Brothers gave us some wonderful promotional material and educational material that we're starting to post in our social media sites. Uh, and the rule, I believe, is three feet on either side. So if you put it on one side of your driveway, you can put one off into the grass and then one right at your edge okay. of your driveway. As long as there's three feet, um, I, the you know, there's a video out there where a woman sitting on a park bench and it grabs the <laughs> so we don't want any anything like that so yeah three feet is a pretty safe safe distance Great. thank so. you that was sure. all. thanks i i was smirking before because i think <laughs> the the important thing is communication right sure. um there's some feedback that i heard from residents the the first one in terms of communicating this change i think the fourth of july parade with our um garbage vehicles out there and a banner saying automation coming in whatever X date, right? Um, both sides, you'll be visible to a lot of our residents during that time. It's already done. Um, maybe have the, the grabber or claw <laughs> on there with some, <laughs> some signs. But the other thing is that we still provide in-house refuse pickup. And the important yeah. thing is that if it doesn't fit, it's still going to be picked up because yeah. our staff do the job. And I did notice some residents lost sight of that. They jumped automatically from toter to now I can't throw anything else that doesn't fit in the toter away. So yep. just driving that home. Yeah, Bill, Bill has made it very clear to me in every single conversation we've had, and the residents need to be reminded there is no <laughs> change in service. Mm -hmm. If you put it to the curb, we are going to take yep. it. Yeah. So, uh, and I, I, you know, I re uh, agree, and, and our guys are great, and if it's out there, they'll find a way to get it in the truck. Perfect. Thank you. I did see Alderman McHale and Veneziano. Uh, just really quickly to clarify, uh, you're going to deliver all the same size bins at first, and then if there is a senior that does not want this giant bin in their garage, they can eventually call to get that to the smaller size. Is that correct? Yeah, I think eventually is the key, especially if they're currently using that sized one. Chances are we're providing a service. We would probably try to encourage them to take advantage of the backdoor service first. Okay. A, lot, a lot of residents don't realize we have that. We plan on promoting that service as well um, uh, as, as a way to deter people from getting the smaller container. The reality is, um, but, but flood has been great. Um, but we did agree that there needs to be a little bit of a growing pain period mm -hmm. where people learn to deal with what they have. Um, that's the problem I saw in Lincolnshire is, you know, tons of people ordered a size they thought they wanted and then realized they wanted a different size. And then the vendor spent the next two months placing special orders and running one. It, it just became, I, I I know what it was like there, and it was it was not through no fault of the staff, but you, when you try to do too much, you sometimes end up paying for it. It's a logistical so, nightmare. Yeah, yeah. It, it really, yeah. Alderman Veneziano. Thank you. Assessing. So, Rob, you kind of know where I'm going. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so in the newsletter, if we could, like, bullet point senior information um, so that I don't think a lot of seniors, as you know, we've talked about, they don't know about the door back door service. That this would be a great opportunity to get that information to them because sure. I know for a fact they're gonna see these big toters and they are gonna freak out that we yeah. can't get these toters down to the curb um, so I think in the newsletter information out there that it's bullet pointed seniors like and then the information and, and very and specific to yes them. I'm sorry to interrupt and, and you're absolutely right and we've talked um, a, as a team uh, through this and we're going to try to steer um, the right calls to Flood Brothers directly, um, but residents should always be comfortable to call Public Works. Mm -hmm. and, and we love getting those calls from our seniors and helping them through any process. So any seniors out there listening, please call Public Works if you have any concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Bissessi. Okay, just a, a handful of questions. Uh, first one, I wanna make sure that, um, let's say there is a senior or something during the time that they uh, you know they're not doing the back door service server the 
bin is optional. They can still bring their garbage to the curb the way that they've been bringing their garbage to the curb. It is, but we strongly want to encourage we them want to, to encourage use it. it to get the benefits. Of <laughs> yeah, it. yeah, I, I mean, understand it, that. We're, we're, I mean, the city's paying for the vendor to go through with the automated equipment, so we would try to encourage it. Yes. Okay. Uh, second thing, the uh, the bins uh, themselves. Um, how do I say this? Uh, residents should be putting their garbage in whether it be uh, plastic bags or some yes. other type of bag and then yeah. putting that bag into the container yeah not just having the bag the the bag you the container just outside their back door and L loose trash loose yeah. trash in it all the yeah. time. yeah yeah the the, the 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 containers are containers for your refuse or res uh, refuse bags so when so you, when you fill clear. your kitchen garbage <laughs> bag, you should tie it and put it in your container. It's not a, uh, a, 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 a bin, if you will. It seems like common sense, but you how, never know. People have outdoor parties. How, People how, have yeah. things like that. They'll, they just, okay, here it is. Just throw it all in here. However, for your recycling container, it's the opposite, right? <laughs> so yes. for your recycling container, don't put it in a bag. Put it in loose and clean. And yes, rinse out your ketchup container. Um, I, I know it's hard, but, but you should do that and uh, rinse it out clean and then put it in your recycling container. And again, the, the, great, the great opportunity for us as a department going through this is the opportunity to present a lot of this information kind of like a, a, a um, I don't know how to explain it, but a, 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 just a bunch of information regarding our, our operation all at once to really educate people because they will be paying attention to it right now. It won't just be white noise. Okay. Uh, next question is uh, back when we discussed this originally, mm -hmm. I know there are residents that currently have two recycling bins. How are we handling it when they have two recycling bins? Will they still have <coughs> two recycling bins? Those people pay one. Right. So they own that. They own the second one. Mm -hmm. The city owns the first one. They own the second one. So they, they're Did you guys all hear that? Should yeah. I repeat it again? Um, the city, uh, <coughs> most of the residents who have two containers mm -hmm. purchased their second container themselves. So, so that is their container. The city only owns one container. Um, so that can I, remain a recycling container. Because I do, I, I actually have personal experience on that. Mm -hmm. I do have two of them. The original one had a green lid. The new one has a yellow lid. Or the additional one that we bought sure. has a yellow lid. Then you so certainly the can use that. the yellow lid one would just stay recycling. Sure. Um, sure. If we know that today the stickers are coming out, probably try not to put it out there that day. Well, <laughs> we, we won't put a sticker on a yellow lid. Yellow, okay. yellow means recycling. We're only putting a sticker on the green ones that if you look at the top, uh, there's uh -huh. a 35 and, and, it, and it lists um, all the different recycling requirements. We've, we're putting a, a sticker over that so there's no confusion for residents. So, so green, li green lids will be trash, yellow yes. lids will be? Recycling. Recycling, okay, yes. that's good. Perfect. Um, next thing is more in, in the weeds, uh, you know, through reading through the, the packet in that. The, uh, um, the cost of this to the city yeah, I didn't get to that. Is that phase yeah. two? Yeah, is that yeah that's <laughs> phase two. Do you mind if I just go through real quick? Talk about yeah. that first. If there's any other questions, I'll, I'll go through with the second part. And again, I, I know the second part that we provided has little to nothing to do with refuse automation, except for the fact that during our conversations in the past, we have had requests for this information. So our staff did a great job, Bill and Joel and, and uh, James Culpepper, did a great job at, at researching other communities pricing structures it wasn't as simple as we thought it would be where you just plug in a number they have different programs and plans and 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 options where you could do all these different things but what we ultimately <coughs> found and your attachment should show it pretty clear is that generally with yard waste the city is about third third highest amongst the the communities surveyed um, the second scenario provides a little bit more of a um, option of a resident that uses 
not overly uses, but just uses all the services. You know, maybe gets rid of one dryer and uh, does one little bathroom remodel and then uses yard waste. In that scenario, the city is fourth highest or third out of. least expensive out of seven. I believe they're six or seven. Six. Yeah, so four of six. So they're four of six. What what Joellen and the team found is no matter how many scenarios they ran, the more services a resident takes advantage of, the more savings a resident has in Rolling Meadows than in the other communities. So it, it's one of those deals where if a resident just puts out their trash, doesn't do yard waste, has a landscaper, yeah, they're probably paying a higher rate. But if, but if a resident you know, we, we assume 34 bags, so like one bag a week of yard waste, um, one contain, uh, one white good, one electronic pickup, and, um, and I think there was another, oh, uh, one, one small remodel project. Um, then they're saving dramatically. And, and the item that we didn't put in there that I realized does have a cost factor to it if you've ever sat on the phone with a, they don't have to call us. Anything they can get out to the curb, any time of day, it could be midnight, five o'clock in the morning, if they can drag a sofa out, we're gonna take it. Whereas all the other services requires you to call first for a special pickup. And every time that call gets made, that's time out of that person's life that they have to do that. So that's another cost. I really believe that the average resident is paying less than, or at least less than, if not dramatically less than, most of the communities that we survey. So, and, and that's just my own opinion. We certainly can run different scenarios, but as you see in the research they did, there's these menu options that, and I think one community does their funding source differently, which throws it all out of whack. So um, we, we did the best we could to kind of line it up apples to apples. <coughs> and that's really for your own information. I'm happy to answer any questions, but that's really for your own information to help you answer resident questions when they call and see an article about a community getting a, a cheaper refuse rate. It doesn't tell the whole story. Thank you for sharing that. Alderman Bassessi, yeah. did you have? No, yeah. Okay, on, on your chart, it says, when, when comparing the other areas, and the bulk items, remodeling debris? Yes. Just wanna make sure I understand the uh, abbreviation CY. Calendar. Cubic, cubic yards. Cubic yard. Oh. Cubic yard. Yes. Okay, because I always th think think that calendar year, I'm like, <laughs> so it's a cubic no. yard. Yeah. So, so in these other areas, you know how we have the program during the uh, spring through the fall where you can put you know the, the four foot bundles of branches and bushes and stuff like that yeah. out yes we don't charge extra for that these other places would that fall into the bulk item no th that, that that's waste? in their yard waste program some so of they them have, to, have a lot of them they have to sticker those yeah each bundle yes yep. holy crap <laughs> yeah, and a lot of those stickers are very expensive, and that's why we, we were very conservative when we were talking about yard waste, just in saying one bag a week. And yeah. you, we all know that there's way more than one bag a week. Yeah. Okay, and then based on putting the automation in there, um, it says in there that there's a, I'm trying to talk into both the mic and. <laughs> it's okay, I don't mind if you don't look okay. at me when you talk. <laughs> uh, it, says that, uh, it says that there's a potential cost savings of uh, fifteen thousand uh, dollars through through uh, efficiencies and things. Uh, that's is that from the, from the previous memo? memo or was manpower yeah. related? Manpower yeah, there's related? there's a variety of savings that we expect to realize. The the I, I can tell you the biggest savings to me is um, not necessarily manpower because the reality is the guys are so efficient, especially with the front. We're saving a lot of time when we went from the rear loader to the front loader. This, that, that automated thing still takes three or four seconds to do this and go back and, and for a guy to just jump on, grab two bags, throw it in and jump, the time savings is not significant. It's the wear and tear on their body. It's for mm -hmm. them lasting 
15 years in the in the refuse division as opposed to seven or eight yeah. there's a huge savings there that you know bill can speak to that much greater than i can but he's been working here for almost 40 years and seeing what that does to a, a, a employee's body over time and that's where i think we're going to see the real it might not be actual real physical dollars that you can grab but it's it's savings overall in, in a variety of, of ways yeah. like 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 potentially worker comp and, and various other yeah i don't exactly know how our irma is okay, structured so that's but part of it <laughs> I, i'm just trying yeah. to reconcile yeah. the dollars because on the other end of it there is a uh what did it say ten dollars and something cents per year charge to the that's city. the annual increase. The yeah, annual that's the recycling yeah. container increase and eighty six cents a right, month. Right, that the city yeah. is currently the city will be picking up. So anybody listening, <laughs> it's not not on you <laughs> yet. Um, so that I know our refuse fund is very tight. So I'm still trying to figure out how that's going to be offset when we're projecting to be under under our fund limits in that fund and, and i think uh, you know I, I i will say that i think staff has heard this problem um, during previous meetings and our expectation is that will be a serious discussion during our budget meetings okay yeah thank you director horn i was going to say we will have a, a comprehensive conversation during our our refuse fund in the summer months and leading up to september of next year okay because we had talked at one time about when it's implemented there could be other things that happen so okay i'll wait till budget time thank you very much sir there's nothing else I'll well, I had a similar thought to that and i know I, i'm glad you said that it was a question i had mr mayor for phase two just rough ballpark estimate we're talking about almost a half a million dollars is that correct with my look at my numbers here the 1032 per month for five years is roughly it's, the yeah. 360k and then the outfit in the trucks is about 120 with that little bit of increase so yeah. just ballpark wise it's, if it's we get a question what's this cost i think everybody's for yeah. i've never gotten a call and said no i want to keep my plastic bags i like where the plastic totes because the raccoons yeah. um so i'm all for this just but ballpark roughly it's, is it's it's 62,500 a year or 360,000 um over the five-year period Plus, you're right. Plus, uh, about 120,000 for okay. equipment. That's all. Yeah. It is a capex cost too, so it, it right. carries itself. Right. Alderman uh, Sonoika, and then I'll get my second bite. Okay. Get there first. Alderman Sonoika. Thank you. I I just also want to um, let the council know that we have a bond that's expiring after this year, which will release an additional amount of funds. If that's the concern at this point, I don't, I'm not, I don't think that's an issue at this point for this discussion. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Snoika, Alderman Bissessi. Okay. Um, my next, just one other question along this line, and then uh, I, I'm done. The, uh, once we, res I'm assuming that we start paying for the, uh, the extra amount per, per bin per, per household when we get the bins. It's not something that's gonna wait. We're gonna have to pay those bills before next year's budgeting. August 1st, we will start paying those, um, but we have budgeted $62,500. It will be less, uh, was it seven months, eight months? It'll be less seven or eight months because we won't have to pay for the months they weren't being used. So this first year will only be about a third of the 62, that's so about, probably about $25,000 will um, we'll, we'll, we'll be, we'll be paid out of this budget then of course we'll have to talk about next year's budget during the budget process. No, I, I get that it's just my my biggest fear is that we're going to be at some point towards uh third quarter or fourth quarter especially with inflation and everything um although most of our costs are protected mm -hmm. um that we're going to be having a conversation about a transfer to that fund because we don't want to go below the fund balance. That's a non-starter in my book. Transfers into enterprise funds are a no-no when it comes to the auditors and stuff. And my concern is it affecting our our, our uh, ratings. No. Uh, our previous financial director kept preaching that year after year. So 
if it's not a no-no, then I don't care. But that's what I've heard. Thank you, Alderman Bissessi. Alderman Sunoika? I want to just clarify my previous comment because it, it, maybe, maybe there was something that was lost in understanding that. So at this point, for our fund balance, we have a bond that's expiring after this year, and we can direct funds from the bond that's expiring to this fund to continue to be within our fund parameters. At this point, there's no risk of us not being within those fund parameters. But I don't want to, this is not a budget discussion here either. Uh, no, so I, I would like for us to uh, move on it. to the it's next issue. And I don't think that it's very responsible for Alderman to have any inclination that we're not within our fund parameters for any of our funds, because that's, it's not true. Then how come we got something when we passed the budget? Mm -hmm. I'll stop it now, but when we passed the budget that said we were not with it, not gonna, we were projecting not to be within it. It's in writing, in black and white. And, and as I said, uh, during the summer months when we begin our conversations with the budget and we're aligning it for the future year, there will be a comprehensive conversation about this refuse fund and it, it will help. It just, this evening is not the appropriate time to get into that. There was a, a component of the presentation that spoke about funding for our information using some examples based on uh, analysis that staff performed, including Director Horn. But I assure you, this is not going to be an impact to the residents and their tax dollars in a significant scope by any capacity. So if there are further questions on the toters or the actual update to our machines, we'll, we have staff here available for that. Set. We're set. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Now I think we'll pivot to uh, our building codes and some updates with that. And for this, we're going to uh, actually have Elizabeth and Dan. You guys are going to present this evening for us. Thank you. Thank you. It's like I can feel it coming like freezing. Yeah, it's like it's a cold draft coming. Good evening, Mayor Gallo. Good evening, <laughs> members of the council. Thank you. Wonderful to see you all again. Um, yeah, th I, I didn't think we'd be here quite yet, but you know, it's good to be back in the council chambers. Uh, good to see everybody's faces. So um, tonight we're going to be talking a little bit about the uh, building code update that we have been working on for multiple months at this point. Uh, we had previously come before the council to get some direction at a previous committee of the whole meeting uh, with regards to the building code update and uh, here we are this evening to share with you the fruits of our labors. Um, so a little bit about the update. Uh, we are updating from the 2009 International Code Council uh, code sets to the 2018. Last time this was comprehensively, uh, well not comprehensively, the last time it was updated was uh, around two, uh, 2010. So it's been over 10 years since our last updates. Technology has changed, um, materials have changed, you know, and the, the new code sets that we're updating will address those things. Um, so the new technologies require these, these updated codes for us to be able to uh, manage that kind of construction in a responsible manner in the city. Um, the local amendments when we started out had over a hundred pages. <laughs> they haven't been comprehensively updated for many many years. A lot of the amendments were just moved forward with each progressive code update and added to or modified as needed without anybody going back through and taking a look at you know what they actually said and what their relevance were so um, these are just this is just the introductions to the local amendments um, and if you take a look here this is now the introduction that same section to the local amendments which we have reduced by about half um, we reduced the the total number of code amendment pages from 100 to about 40 uh, and that includes eight code books uh, the, which uh, the the old the 2009 ICC sets were with seven. Um, we there were a lot of redundant amendments. There were a lot of things that were um, covered in the code books that no longer needed to be a separate amendment. So we were able to go through, recognize those, modify, remove as required. Some of the amendments were also no longer relevant. The technologies weren't um, weren't you know in place anymore. weren't used anymore. Um, so we were able to remove those as well. Uh, as I noted, the codes that we're adopting are the 2008 Code Council, International Code Council set, which includes all of these books. Um, in addition to the ICC codes, we'll also be adopting the 
uh, 2017 National Electrical Code as, as part of this as well. Um, there are certain codes that are required by other agencies. Um, we are allowed to propose amendments to make them stricter than what the other agencies um, require, but we are not proposing them at, those, at this time. The most common ones that we run into are the State Plumbing Code, the Accessibility Code, um, but we also um, will, are required to follow the uh, National Fire Protection Agency Life Safety Code, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District Watershed Management Ordinance, and the uh, State Elevator Safety and Regulation Act. So we are not proposing any amendments or changes to any of those. We're just going to follow them as laid out by the state. Um, so in order to uh, talk a little bit about some of the bigger highlights, I'd like to present to you our building official, Dan Street. He uh, joined our department in on January 31st and uh, really took the bull by the horns on this one, so. Evening. Nice to meet everybody for the first time. So, pleasure to be here. So, uh, as Elizabeth said, we are proposing to go from the 2009 version I codes and the 2000, uh, currently the eight NEC to the 2018 and the 2017 NEC. Um, codes are updated every three years. Uh, it's a three year code cycle. Whether the municipality chooses to adopt those codes or not, they're updated every three years. Um, with any code change, um, for the most part, a lot of them are new definitions, new interpretations as they become available, um, a lot of new uh, building science, um, and unfortunately, a lot of times there's a lot of injuries or deaths, so codes are updated with accordance of that. Because at the end of the day, what building codes are, um, they're, they're safety issues, and they're here to enforce the public safety as well as the residents and, and future residents of the town. Um, so as we go forward, some of, the, some of the highlights that we'll be looking at from the code books that we currently have in place and what we're proposing to go to, um, the biggest one and the first and foremost one is a new book that was created. It's the uh, International Pool and Spa Book. Uh, in the previous books, we did not have any real definitions for swimming pools, believe it or not. Um, and especially with today, we can go to Menards, we can go to Home Depot, and we can pretty much buy a thousand gallon swimming pool with a, and you've all seen them in the yards, you know, with a little portable, maybe some of you have them with a portable filter. Um, the unfortunate thing is that a lot of the building codes did not have any rules or regulations to enforce these because it's all kind of newer technology. Um, you'll see a lot of these leaving um, blow up spas where Coleman has a little blow up portable spa. You'll see the exercise spas. You'll see all the new types of door latches and locks. So the old codes only had about three pages to address this. And with now the creation of a new book, we have about 40, 50 pages to address all of the swimming pool and spa codes, uh, not only commercial, but residential. So one of the bigger changes. Uh, some other code highlights, we get into the fire pump rooms. A lot of our fire pump rooms that you'll see access doors to, um, they're only accessible from the outside. So this was a problem with the code because they're not um, accessible from the interior of the codes. So the code addressed this. They said within that we need to have that door clearly marked for fire rescue personnel. Um, we need to put heating elements. Believe it or not, we, a lot of the, uh, the codes never address heating elements for areas of the country such as us. So because they were not accessible from the inside, a lot of these um, sprinkler rooms were uh, exploding because of frost. Um, also, they need to have emergency lighting. We get into there with the fire department, they go, what? Well, we can't see. Um, some of the emergency lighting is only required for the means of egress. So they, they made some changes, say, so hey, let's, let's get some emergency lighting in there. Technology, technology is always changing. So the biggest thing with some of the technology that we have now are smoke alarms. Some of you might have alarm systems that goes off on your phone to let you know, hey, there's a smoke alarm going off of the house. Nest, Google, we've all got wireless technology now, so in the older codes, wireless was never addressed, and in the newer codes going forward, they addressed that issue. Wall bracing. Uh, some of the, the new building science has told us that we can make our homes stronger by not only uh, reinforcing some of the plywood. Uh, maybe back in the olden days, you saw your house on the corners of your house you had strong plywood and then on the middle you would have foam insulation. That building science has told us that we can no longer get the insulation from the interior of the house and we can make the, uh, the outside of the house stronger. So they want you to reinforce the outside with plywood and get all your R values now from the inside. So they have a wall bracing requirements. Decks, believe it or not, I'll assume that that's the next one, span charts. So a lot of the wood that we're now using for, for timber, like we go to the lumber yard <coughs> Menards, um, it's coming from trees that are that are grown, farm trees. 
They're no longer here from Mother Nature. It's, the trees are not that mature. So what we've discovered is that a lot of the trees do not have the structural strength that they used to in the past. So a lot of the new span charts will address that something that couldn't previously span like 15 foot one uh, can no longer span that. So they've addressed a lot of the span charts with uh, farm, farm timber. Uh, decks, believe it or not, there's never been a section in the building code who addressed decks. Um, so uh, the building code got tired of seeing everybody on the 10 o'clock news for decks collapse. So they've created its own chapter now for building officials, contractors, homeowners, how to construct a deck. Footings, beams, attachments, how they can be constructed so that we have no vertical or horizontal shifting, so we no longer have deck collapsing. So that'll probably be one of the bigger changes for our, our, for our residents that do a lot of uh, their own home construction or contractors. Um, you'll no longer see these little footings or these little connectors. It's, uh, it's going to be quite of a, probably one of the bigger changes for us. Wind design. As Mother Nature changes, so does the building code. So Mother Nature has told us that we're getting uh, a little bit stronger wind speeds. So when we construct a roof here, whether it's trusses or, believe it or not, solar panels, uh, was one of the bigger things that we must construct the roof to withstand 115 miles per hour. Um, a lot of people put up these solar panels back in the day and they go, well, we never thought about it acting like a sail. Uh, I've actually seen where a solar panel can actually uplift the, the edge of a house because it, it does, in, in fact, act like a sail. So when now people submit plans, they must show us that the, not only the manufacturer, but all the attachments are designed for 150 miles per hour. And then we get into some green technology. As we talked about just solar systems, Hard to go anywhere these days without seeing a rooftop solar system in a neighborhood. So the code now has addressed those. Prior to that, there was nothing in the code to address it. Um, we get into some shutdown systems. It's very difficult for a fire rescue personnel to be at a um, to be at a fire and turn off the power to the house and realize, hey, it's still energized by the solar system. So there was no code language to tell the manufacturer or the fire department of how we have to shut that down. So now the code actually requires what they call a rapid shutdown system on every rooftop solar so that when the fire department goes there, they hit that switch and within 10 seconds it has to be de-energized. Um, also pathways on the roof. A fire department, uh, fire, uh, fire department personnel can never get on the roof to access the actual pathway on a roof for venting purposes or maybe even for construction personnel. Um, so now there's actually pathways so that are determined where solar panels can and can't go. Electric vehicles, another big thing in technology. We never, 10 years ago, you know, electric vehicle was kind of a thing that you never had to address. So now in every new construction house, not only do you have to have an outlet in it, the garage, as you only before, you only had to have one, you have to have one now dedicated in each bay for the service of an electric vehicle. Granted, when you have an electric car, it usually takes 30 or 40 amps, you have to put in a special outlet, but every electric car can be charged by the single volt, uh, 110 volt outlet that's in a house. So now they say one shall be dedicated in each bay so that you can charge your car if you have one. Tamper resistant receptacles. Since 2008, tamper resistant receptacles have been required in, in new construction. And what is a tamper resistant receptacle? It's so that a child cannot shock themselves in the outlet. They can take a screwdriver, stick it in the outlet, and they can't get shocked. You have to take two simultaneously, open up the circuit, and get shocked. So now there's new requirements. Um, the intent of it in 2008 was requirement in all residential houses for children, but we forgot, well, what about daycares? Uh, we kind of left that one out because the intent was to protect children, so we go, uh oh, we, we forgot that section. So now in daycares, hotels, we, we've added that section for, uh, for uh, inspectors to, to take a look at. Arc fault protection kind of goes hand in hand with tamper resistant. What is arc fault? So two wires, even if they're not touching, they can slow arc. And when they're arcing, what are they doing? They're heating up and they can cause a fire. So in residential construction now, most of your circuitry that you install, excuse me, it has to have an arc fault breaker. So that if it detects an arc in the circuit or the, or in the device that's plugged in, it shuts off the power of that room for fire purposes. So new requirements are where they're requir required in residential construction. And that's pretty much the highlights kind of going forward from the 2000 to 2018. A lot of green technology, a lot of lumber timber, a lot of climate change, uh, but for the most part, you know, everything that's building safety to help protect the residents. Thank you for the updates and the presentation. Um, any questions from the council on these updates or their impacts? I do. 
Alderman Zemeckin. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. So um, I know that you had mentioned in your presentation that some of these would be quite different from what residents are used to. Are there any plans as far as outreach on any of these proposed changes? Um, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, we have been advertising the fact that we are going to be um, talking about this here tonight at our counter so that all of our contractors and homeowners are aware of it. Um, after this evening, it's our intention to bring this forward to council for consideration of full adoption um, at the two meetings in April. So between now and April, or not between now and when we take it live, which I think we're leaning towards July 1st at this time, uh, we'll be advertising and uh, leveraging as much as we can the city sign, uh, the newsletter, the uh, public works social media page. So as much as we can leverage to get the word out there, um, this we will. Um, I, I think we'll find that our contractors will also be very thankful for this because a lot of the, the towns in our area are all at the more updated codes, the 15 or 18, as opposed to the 09. So I think this is a, a good change that people will be glad to see. Um, can, could staff perhaps um, provide a one sheet um, FAQ that we can provide to our residents directly? Or maybe if um, this is a task that we can have for the newly created communications committee as well, that would, I think, be most helpful for us because then we can reference that and give that to them. That's certainly something we can look into. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Stoica. Any other questions or comments? Alderman Budmans, then O'Brien. Um, so help me understand. As of July the 1st, this is going to be your code if it's just passed in April? Yes. So how does that give people who've already been in the process of doing designs on their projects and already drawn plans up, how do we accommodate those people who've already done that? Are we going to have them go back to the drawing board? No, of course not. Anyone who um, is in process uh, or submits a permit prior to the July 1st going live with the 2018 codes will be allowed to continue under the 2009. They won't have to change their plans to update. Um, especially if they've already been in process. We, we do have some permits that are, are going through the process right now. We're not going to go back and make them require to adhere to the 2018s. It just seems really quick for a phase of, just saying, from a contractor's point of view, if I'm bidding work now and I'm bidding it and I don't even know that you're doing a code change, um, it, it seems very fast to, to come in that short of a time period. I've seen I've seen municipalities, especially in the elevator code, take longer t for a phase in, and so I, I would expect you guys to extend a lot of grace on on this for for a little bit of time because otherwise you're going to have you're going to have a lot of irritated people who've already built plans, and if they come in on July the fourth, they're going to be pretty pretty cranky. Well, I certainly hope they won't come in on July fourth. We'll be closed. <laughs> But yeah, of, of course, we'll, we'll, we will work with our contractors, our businesses, and our residents to, to make sure that the project is as best as possible. We don't want to overly inconvenience uh, anyone, but the idea behind these codes is to make everybody safer and to adapt to the new technologies. So um, if, there's, if there's issues, if there's troubles, then certainly we will work with those people. Okay. So Alderman Budmatz, I appreciate you bringing that up. I was going to hold this question till the end because it's a, it's a selfish question. It's a personal question, but I'm sure others might have it. I'm sitting on a set of plans at home for a uh, garage, mm -hmm. and I haven't submitted them yet because I'm, I'm not ready, but the architecturals are drawn up, and they're based on previous code uh, codes that have been adopted. Mm -hmm. And so how would that impact me? Uh, should I rush to submit them now to be in a green zone, or... Can I expect to submit them when I'm ready, but then have a bunch of red line revisions to mirror the updated codes that we've adopted? How does it work? Um, I'm going to let Dan answer that. Yeah, and you got to remember, like, even though we're adopting the codes, there's not huge dramatic changes from a, lo a general construction project such as yours. Um, the, the spans wouldn't change. You know, the, the only thing that may change would be, like I said, the, the wind design. Um, but in 99% of the time for, for a general residential project, there's not going to be a lot of dramatic changes with regards to that. And like I said, if, if we're, we're right along the timeline of where things are being submitted and things were designed right around that time, we're, we're going to work with the residents and business owners. But there's not going to be huge dramatic changes with that regards. Okay. And I don't imagine many people being in my situation. I'm sure there's commercial projects that are sure. far more complex that are in the process. And if we are going to take the adoption into consideration in a very 
expedited manner that could impact some and I hope we would be flexible but uh, I figure if I'm somebody that has a set of plans waiting and I'm just not ready yet uh, there's got to be at least one more person and I don't want to see them have to scramble or then have to jump through hoops after the fact because they weren't aware of our city going through this adoption rate if, if I may also add Mayor Gallo um, we would generally encourage people to at least submit the application get everything started um, the way our codes are, are laid out everything is valid for six months as long as there's you know as long as there's process so if you submit your application next month then it's that it's good for six months to go through the process you get in under the 2009 um, once the permit is issued then it's to those plans to that were approved under the 2009 codes the permits then good for six months or you know for as long as we're seeing activity um, if there's no activity within that six months time frame you can apply to the building department for uh, an extension whether that be for the review or whether that be for the permit will certainly work with if we're with you or with anyone mm -hmm. thank you thank you alderman o'brien for letting no, me uh, keep I'm that good. Conversation thank going. you sir yeah okay. i'm all set any other questions or comments from the council thank you for the updates appreciate it thank you very much so move us on to what is this now we're on the fourth item here with the water shut off and delinquent payment discussion which we had previously at the beginning of this year um, in January and we're revisiting this now and so for this uh, director Horn I think you're gonna take it away for the start thank you mayor before I start I just want to thank Elizabeth and Dan again I know you've only seen it a little bit but they've been working on this for a year and a half or more and Dan since coming on has done an amazing job um, going through every single code amendment to make sure whether it's valid or not I, I don't think you can appreciate how much work that is so I really want to thank the team for that effort <laughs> Wow <laughs> clapping that's awesome good job um, anyways so uh, uh, getting back to the matter at hand uh, water shut off presentation that we did in uh, January talking about some of the issues, uh, the policy that the council had established back a uh, um, couple years ago now um, to assist uh, residents through the COVID period uh, and help people through that, that, that time when people were losing their jobs and, and being laid off and, and really struggling through that, that timeline. Um, we presented a variety of information um, related to how that's impacted to the city to date. Um, City Council had asked us uh, for some follow-up information I was going to walk through that information and then um, some of the high points or, or highlight uh, some of the points that the Finance Department staff made uh, that I was not aware of um, uh, as I'm passing out kudos I do have to give kudos to the Finance Department did really an amazing job looking through uh, new data is easy to look through old data in old software and old Excel spreadsheets is not and they did an amazing job um, helping me prepare this information for tonight so um, the first uh, question that was asked was um, uh, the number of delinquent accounts total uh, based on our total accounts it looks like about three to three and a half percent of all of our accounts are would be considered delinquent and delinquency means that they're over 300 that, uh, um, that's not true um, delinquent accounts mean they have a balance on their account that is unpaid so um, three and a half percent as it says in the mem memo there's 15 commercial uh, accounts and 242 residential please understand that number will never be exact <laughs> because the day I prepare it someone will come in and pay their bills so um, it's always a fluid number um, the other question that was asked was to, to find out the number of delinquent accounts, commercial versus residential. Uh, generally, these were averages, again, because we're having to use old data and new data together. Um, generally, commercial accounts, um, we, we end up with about 10 customers who, are, um, who get what's called a, what do they call it here? A, um, it's a notice basically it's a notice means that uh, a notice means it's your first warning for a shutoff so we get about 10 of those a month for commercial properties uh, the one thing that's important to note I did note it in there but I didn't explain it very well is um, commercial properties generally have a single pipe that comes or a single pipe that comes into their building 
and it splits off inside their building, fire sprinkler and domestic. Because of that, we don't shut off commercial buildings because we can't turn off their fire protection. So we threaten to shut them off, but we don't shut them off because they're commercial properties. So, um, and then uh, same question on residential. Uh, city pursues about 150 uh, uh, customers for uh, late or non-payments per billing cycle. And of those, about half usually end up getting the final warning, basically. And then of those, about a half dozen or less, we actually have to shut off per month. Um, that's historical and, and is, I would say, is true today if we were doing it. So, um, and then the, the last one that I can really give you an answer on is the number of current delinquent accounts. You did see an attachment that I provided. Um, there's about four or five pages. Those show all the delinquent accounts. Um, the difference, a delinquent account is any account that owes money. There's a, uh, an account is, um, the finance department used another term, but it basically means if you have $300 or more, you're on like a, a, a list of a potential shut off if it's over $300 owed to the city. So um, there are two different lists, but, but based on what they're telling me is upwards of 80% of the accounts that are currently delinquent are ones that were regularly delinquent before 2020. Um, uh, staff was very adamant. These are a, a lot of the, the customers are repeat customers. Um, uh, some information, oh, the last question everyone uh, that was asked at that meeting, at least the way I understood it, was was there a way to decipher whether uh, a resident was basically taking advantage of the system? And I had a long conversation with our accounts person uh, on this issue, and the reality is if a resident asks for help, we give them whatever help they ha that we have to give them. We don't ask them for any proof, you know, are you, prove why you're, you know, you can't make your payment. You know, we don't ask for anything. If you need help, you ask our staff and we, they implement the options they have available to them to help the resident. Um, that's just how they do it. So we really wouldn't gather any information like that. Um, some, some key pieces of information that I, that I grabbed out of the memo that I think are important is um, uh, from our finance staff specifically is, um, a good percentage of the repeat delinquent accounts do attempt to make payments on their accounts regularly, which is a good thing. So we, they are working on it, even though it shows as delinquent, they are making payments regularly. Um, the, the higher percentage under that is accounts that have not paid anything at all since the council made this policy. So they have actually stopped making payments, period. Um, uh, I found it interesting that um, um, some of our re repeat delinquent accounts have moved out of the community, which now means that that account is delinquent and we can only recover those costs once a property sells and we can get that money through real estate transfer stamp process. Um, and the one that I found most interesting, I, I don't know how we stopped this, is residents have actually moved into the city and are not paying a water bill <laughs> because they moved in. I don't know how that is happening. That's something obviously as a staff we're gonna look into and figure out how that works. But, but they've moved in and because there's no um, repercussions for not paying their water bills, they're just not paying it. They haven't even set up an account for it. There's no motivation to do it. I'm assuming, I, I can't imagine that's a significant number, but they did say some residents have moved in, so that means more than one. So um, uh, uh, another point, uh, if you read in the memo, uh, our staff uh, has indicated that only one resident has come in for help and specifically noted they needed help because of a job loss. So I think that's a good thing because it means a lot of our delinquent accounts are not people who do, are not employed um, because as we've said, I think even in the previous meeting, you know, call us. We we have programs to help you, which which 
um, um, brings me to my last point I want to make. Uh, the city, um, our staff, our public works staff did work in January. Um, uh, we went to, uh, um, Ryan Rivard went to a uh, Cook County uh, webinar about a CETA program. Community, uh, what's it called? Community and Economic Development Association of Cook County. It's the CETA program. It basically is specifically for people having trouble paying their utilities. It offers assistance for utility billing. It's a fund that comes right from Cook County. You apply for it. We would be a person who could administer and actually do the application process on behalf of the resident. Um, that is a program that we uh, uh, investigated. I, I recall now, uh, after talking to staff, we were waiting for our new city manager to start before we implemented that and make sure it was something we wanted to be involved in. We have since started implementing that. I think our um, uh, finance director is filling out the proper applications and agreements that need to be in place for that process. So I think, uh, and, and just just to, to tie, put a bow on it, um, the, the city does have programs or, or, or um, opportunities to help residents pay their bills slowly over time. Um, we don't shut off residents who are trying to pay their bills. And we do have other avenues to help maybe more than the city can help with actual real tangible dollars um, um, moving forward for those residents that might still truly be in need. So I'll, uh, at that, I'll leave, let the city manager speak. If I could just add one uh, point to add on to Director Horn's identification of the CETA program. So the program itself is called the Illinois Low Income Household Water Assistance Program. It functions similar to LIHEAP, which is an ex a program for home energy that's existed for many years. Um, in summary, it provides a one-time 1500 a, a customer can receive up to $1,500 in assistance to help pay for past due water bills disconnection fees or any late fees and so those the program is administered it came through the ARPA funding that was provided through the county um, and as the director mentioned we are currently getting ourselves enrolled in that so that our residents can partake and also participate <coughs> thank you thank you thank you director Horn thank you manager Sabo for those updates I think now it's time that we engage in the conversation and direction as to what this council uh, would like to do and so with this Alderman Sonoika thanks mr. mayor so I, I have three items that I kind of want to touch on, um, and not included in those three is um, thanking staff for looking into that CETA funding, um, since ultimately when we're when we're looking at this, our goal here is to make sure that we're funding our water infrastructure. And I know we're going to talk a lot about that in item five, so I don't want to spend too much time on this. Um, but I do want to state that if that's the goal that we're doing here, I would like to see staff pursuing various options like they are with CETA to make sure that we have funds for the infrastructure for the water infrastructure itself. Um, that said, I also want to say that I just don't think it's helpful for us to really speculate as to why people are or aren't paying if we don't know and it sounds like we don't really have that data here, um, then it's, it's just not helpful for this discussion. You know, once we asked these questions in January, we found out that we just have residents that aren't paying and it's possible that they just don't know or aren't getting set up or there's maybe some other issues there. So that's why I'm saying I think maybe focusing on speculation and motivation isn't really great for this uh, discussion tonight. Um, that said, I do want to focus on how staff intends to address this issue um, with commercial properties versus residential properties when we really can't shut off. Uh, so that doesn't even seem to be like a relevant question for our residential, I mean for our commercial properties and a significant percentage appears to be like one or two. Um, and uh, is there any tactic that we would want to discuss here that maybe is in the works for those specific Line item. Go ahead, Dr. <laughs> Director Horn, yes. <laughs> um, we have a process in place. We have adjudication process to me. <coughs> for that. Um, we have a court process, um, and, and we pursue those as needed. The finance department uh, uh, comes up, and they have an adjudication day where they handle all their, their cases for delinquent bills. Um, really, I, I think a lot of this, and, and I, I certainly hope I didn't allude to, to anybody's position, but a lot of this has to do with because everything's been put on pause, some of those uh, um, processes that would make people aware of what we're just not doing those. So we don't send a, someone a late notice if we're not going to collect a late fee, so they don't even know if they're late. They don't even know if they're... There's some of that possibility out there. To, so to your point, 
you know, it's possible people don't even know they're doing something wrong or, you know, so that's why I think the biggest thing for staff at this point is to understand, you know, I, I left the original questions. I, I'll leave it up to the mayor to kind of guide through that, you know, as far as what we will really need to know. But, you know, ultimately we want to know, is, it, is the program something we want to go ahead and, and start incorporating again? And if so, what do we do with what's beyond due already? And, and do you want us to, to, to continue to go? In talking to the finance staff, I had mentioned that we had to see whether the council wanted to write off that. And she was like, what? <laughs> like, we've never done that. So, so it's not common to, you know, a lot of times we might wait and not get, the, the account might not be made whole for 10 years when the property sells, but then at that time when the real estate transfer goes through, we will then get payment for that delinquent water bill. So I, I, I just, um, those are the really the key things we need to understand and, um, and then we can proceed with whatever you guys want. Uh, thank you, Director Horn. And, and I would agree with that as well. It's just, again, do we really wanna wait 10 years in order to get, I, I think our largest account on here is yeah. over $50,000. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I would say, no, we don't wanna wait mm -hmm. those 10 years. So. Uh, that's why I think you know having other options are available to that effect would be helpful if we have other residents that have left and we don't have any possibility of recovering those funds until possibly 10 15 years later when the property sells then then that's all that we can do sure. um, it, I don't see really any efficacy with the shutoffs that are associated with this and so if we are shutting off a resident and they leave, or if, or if we have residents that just aren't paying at all, and they leave, then we're still not recovering the, the funds. So, so the shutoffs may or may not be effective for, for very many residents, and so I wanna ask if there's other opportunities that we can do here, and it, it might even just be sending a notice, not a shutoff notice, but a notice if we have other residents who, even, who haven't even started paying their water bills. Yeah, I, you know, and, and, and we certainly will look into all that. And I think if you recall from the, the first memo we provided, um, the finance director requested two months. So we can do some of those notifications and give people an opportunity to understand what the council's uh, course of, of direction was going to be so we can kind of have time to do that. I will say that um, I know this from our own department and uh, I know the finance is the same way we send two notices, we make way more efforts. If a person is actually getting shut off, there's no reason, they know why they're getting shut off because we have made multiple, multiple, multiple tries to try to get them to pay before we do that. I will also say that a lot of those kind of accounts, those residential accounts, it's not abnormal that, I know it sounds crazy, but you know, some of those, a lot of those accounts are like $1,300, $800. We will just collect that when the house sells. I know it's not the best solution, but it's the ironclad solution that doesn't get lost in the, in the weeds. And if someone's already gone, it, it really to me doesn't make sense to waste staff time trying to pursue that. You know, it's kind of like dealing with uh, property maintenance issues on a, on a house that someone's moved away from and we can't find the owner. It, it just doesn't, doesn't, justify the effort necessary. So the $58,000 one, much, much different <laughs> story, but so. So then uh, when a shutoff is happening, then what is the, what is the return on that? Do we typically have then accounts? I know that you're not the finance department, so if sure. you can't answer this, <laughs> then okay. we can, we can certainly yeah. follow up with staff, but we're looking for um, what, is this, is this effective? Cause it sounds like from what you're stating that the ironclad solution is there's a shutoff and then the resident leaves and then we recover those funds at some point in the future when the home sells. Yeah, but those, uh, I, I would say that most of the uh, s uh, shutoffs we go to uh, are not of residents that are leaving. Most of the shutoffs we go to, we shut off and then someone runs to the city hall in a panic by four o'clock to pay their bill and then we call a guy back in to turn the water back on and that, and that is one of those revenue streams that kind of goes with all the other fees that we've put on pause is a, uh, there's penalty fees with that. If, if, you, if you don't pay your bill, we've sent you multiple notices, 
you don't pay your bill and we have to go shut it off, you pay to shut it off and you pay for us to turn it on. I don't know what the exact dollar amounts, but I know there's a penalty fee for both of those activities. So that's a revenue source as well. I think most of the people we go out and shut off are living in the house. They're not moving away, um, most of them. It happens a little bit, but I don't think it's the high, high percentage that I, I think you're concerned about. So I, and I would say, I would finish my comments and questioning at this point with, um, it sounds like we might need more data in order to be able to determine if a shutoff is effective. So it sounds like any data before 2019 <coughs> is not um, easily obtained because we have older systems and software. Um, but if we do have that data back when we did enforce shutoffs, I would like to know how, what the efficacy of those shutoffs were. Or if we typically had residents that would leave because they weren't able to pay their, their water bill and then the city <coughs> wasn't able to recover those funds until we had a real estate transfer stamp. That's all. Thank you, Alderman Sonoika. Alderman O'Brien. Thank you, Ms. Martin. Uh, uh, Director Horn and staff, thanks for all this data. I actually feel comfortable with this. I understand Alderman Sonoika's points on that. The way that I'm viewing this, and it hasn't changed from my, my first 10 when we talked about this in January, and I didn't receive calls on this like we have on many other items. The way I'm viewing this, and again, using the rough numbers that are in here, We've been floating about a half a million dollars to 257 entities, the 242 residents and 15 commercial. We just finished it. I know we're not going budget topic tonight, but we just talked about refuse, and that's going to cost, and we're going to talk about stuff. Down. My concern is here, like I said back in January, I think the numbers are clear here. It's 3.7%, but we're tying up about a half a million dollars in funds from other things the city could be doing. So I'm comfortable, as I said in January, reinstating education letting them know payment plans are available but not doing any late fees i am 100 percent comfortable writing off late fees or penalties yeah. but i'd like to start collecting some of this revenue even if it's 25 dollars a month whatever the resident can set <coughs> up with staff because director horns made it very clear staff will work with the residents i'd like to see us move forward on this to at least get the ball rolling maybe no water turnoffs for six months i can understand Alderman Sonoika's point as we say hey we're going to give you Time till the end of the year, get in, get your stuff in order. We won't shut it off, but, and we're waiving late penalties. I'm okay waiving that, but I think we've got to get back out there because we're tying up a half a million dollars yeah. for 242 entities. So I, I agree with your sentiment on this. For me, I think the most enlightening aspect was the, the percent of current delinquent accounts that are repeat, right? If, if you want to consider uh, grouping them in a repeat, knowing that 80% of them are repeat offenders to being delinquent in their payments. I know that in my mind when we initially implemented this it was in an effort to help families or businesses that were being negatively impacted by the covid pandemic that was occurring but if if we're starting to understand that a majority of those who are following the trend of delinquent in their payments are the same as they were pre-pandemic then i think it, it wasn't it wasn't executed and and used in the spirit in which i thought this policy would have been used so i would i would echo alderman o'brien in putting this back in play alderman budman um, thank you mr mayor so seeing that it, it would seem to me that it's really difficult to occupy a home without water i think it, we should remove occupancy permits from businesses who haven't paid their water bill I understand we can't turn off their water for fire protection reason but if, if a homeowner wouldn't be able to occupy their house without water then the business shouldn't be able to occupy the property without water either or without paying for the water that they're utilizing especially in the case of some business that owes us fifty thousand dollars so yeah I, I'm not a, I'm not beyond using that as a tool because you wouldn't be able to occupy the house with no water yeah, I think I think there's um, I think uh, clarity and the council how we proceed with uh, which I feel like I'm getting right now will have a great effect on the number of delinquent accounts coming back to a more reasonable percentage uh, what we're more used to pre COVID. I think that will have a, a great impact plus our ability to communicate with residents through notifications and letters and s helping set, set up programs to allow them to pay over time. I think we're going to be in a much better place by the end of the year um, with some of your guidance. 
Alderman Veneziano. Thank you. So um, the other the other option that I was thinking of is that if it's a business, then they cannot renew their business license. Mm -hmm. um, and then if they are a repeat offender with their business, then maybe they have to set up a, a like a pre like a deposit in order to get their business license if they're a repeat defender or offender defender. <laughs> late um and and i'm i'm gonna agree with my fe fellow council members here um you know we're kind of getting back to our new norm here and it's time that we reinstate uh you know our shutoff policies and and i i i even agree you know anything new um for uh late notices would have a late fee um, anything for past, we've waived that at this point. But any, you know, when we set a date, anything new, this is our, our we're going back to our old policy, um, and set that date so residents know. Um, it's a stream of revenue that we need as a city, um, so that taxpayers don't have to. The, uh, those of us that pay our bill on a timely manner, so that we don't have to eat costs for other things, and those that don't wish to pay their bills on time need to pay the consequences. That's it. Thank you, Alderman Veneziano. Alderman Bassetti. Yeah. Um, in looking at this list, I, I just want to make sure I got everything straight. Uh, delinquent is if there's a balance. Mm -hmm. And what you said is the majority of those ones, those 250 whatever, it's like they're, um, you know, one to 30 days late or 30 to 60 days late. You know, I noticed that the 90 day late is like a whole bunch of zeros. So people are still paying their bills. They're just behind in. Mm -hmm. In catching up, so sure. it would be my. I would agree with Alderman Veneziano and some of my my peers here that we do need to reinstate our our policies, and I think the communication should go out uh, when we do that and we set a date that um, uh, the city, you know, just make it very very clear the city is willing to work with you if you're making your payments. If you could, you know, we'll work with you to get you. Whole, you know, whole again. I, I know the city manager mentioned that. Uh, yeah, I'm guessing it's imminent. You're sign we're signing up for something with CETA. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And how to create that program. How long do you think that's going to take? We should have that all complete and submitted by this week. It, it should okay, be. It's so a fairly it's quick. It's process. coming really quick. So yes. there's going to be even more options for our residents. I think it really ties. To, I think all of it's an easy on it. It's communication. Just getting it out there, because I believe that the vast majority of the people that are are uh, delinquent, they're still making their they're still paying every every month. They're paying something. They're just behind. Um, so if there's programs to help them, whether it be CETA or whatever, or hey, pay an extra fifty bucks a month or something like that, just till you're caught up, then I think the the contingency on the shutoff is. If you've made absolutely no attempt to contact the city, even though you've been contacted, that that kind of shows your intent. You're not you're not making any uh, effort to try and resolve your situation. So, um, I know you got questions here that you want to get into. So I'll. I'll That's okay. Uh, Alderman Sonoka has uh, her hand up for now. Thanks, Mr. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, so. Uh, a couple of things I would not be in favor of, of reinstalling late fees at this time for a number of reasons the first being that we're still working with Tyler Technologies and our module to make sure that electronic payments work for individuals and there are still some issues with that technology and I would probably want to make it easier on staff to just waive that process at this time as uh, individuals continue to adopt to that new technology. I have received calls from residents regarding that and that they have to call the office to get that situated and that's not always something that they can get done 24 seven. It's when they have time during regular business hours. So I would not be in favor for that reason. And for this uh, item that we have here in front of us, um, I also would want to, um, it sounds like we're going through an adjudication process with that one business, but in businesses in general, it's the same situation where if the business leaves, then we're still stuck with waiting until there's a real estate transfer stamp for that commercial space. Mm -hmm. And that can take a long time as well. So um, I would still want us to 
have a pro-business attitude when we're working with them and see if we can maintain a, a different avenue as opposed to, uh, I suppose, all stick and taking items away and trying to, and unless we have to go through adjudication like we are with the single item or the single participant. Um, do we know if they're still in business now or is this an, are they yeah. active? I didn't want to comment. I, I think okay. I was clear to keep the names of the business off. Okay. Um, it may be a commercial, uh, it may be listed as a commercial account, but maybe a large residential complex. I understand. So that's why, I, that's why it might be high because it may be like, the, the fees of 50 different units or 70 different units in a large residential com complex. So th that's why it might be a big number. I, I would not want to. I understand. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Alderman Sonoika. Any other comments or questions, Alderman Budmans, before we? Yeah, second bite. So I guess the point is, is that if there's a large concern and if we've suspended late fees, um, those late fees, though, should not be suspended when we're the, our only method of recapturing the money is is at the time of a real estate closing. So, I'm assuming that once you've been out that far, that we're able to, at, if we're going to a real estate closing to get our money or waiting for transfer stamps, if we're if we're only doing that and we're only asking what we are owed and without penalty, something's wrong with the system. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to speak to that. I think the uh, someone from the finance staff who follows those through, those through the adjudication process would need to comment. My expectation as we seek, we don't, um, I don't want to say this, we work within the confines of what we're required to do through the policies and codes that you guys establish. Um, we try to work with residents within those guidelines best we can. When we go to an adjudication process, we have to ask for it as it's written in the code. So if, if the code specifically states a penalty fee is required you know, every 30 days, that's what we ask for. The adjudicator can say no, but we ask for what the code dictates. So we don't use a lot of judgment in those instances. We follow what the code states specifically. So, and I, I, I really I appreciate all the conversation regarding the shutoffs and, and all really good conversation. I just want to make sure the council is aware there's a high percentage of people we threaten with shutoff. There's not a high percentage of people we shut off or that stay shut off. So when we're, I'm talking about maybe at the end of the year, three or four in a whole year. So the, the shutoff threat is used every single month. On a, high, on a high percentage of, of properties. But the actual ones we actually shut off and leave shut off is very, very few. So I just want to make sure that- Well, now you're showing our hand. <laughs> Rob, <laughs> Rob, we have coders to pay for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. We just fill those things up with water and <laughs> off of people's houses. Uh, in all seriousness, Alderman Bassesi, you have your hand yeah. up again? Yeah, we do have toters to pay for. Um, but, uh, um, to your to your point, um, you know the the threat of it. Um, they the ones that get shut off are the ones that ignore that. The ones that don't ignore that and actually come and try and make a plan, then they're yeah. Then they're usually in, in okay shelf as long as they're following the plan that was made. It's it's a it's a I, I would have to agree with Alderman Sunoika on this. Uh, most of the residents we deal with who miss a payment, who are late on a payment, who get their water shut off, it's good and it's, it's an accident. I, I forgot, I didn't notice, I was, uh, the big one is people were out of town when the notices came in or they were helping an elderly family mm -hmm. member. I don't want to paint all of our delinquent accounts as irresponsible homeowners or property owners. No, and I'm not trying to do that either. That's I why I want to make it clear that that percentage of the people we deal with is very small. There are, however, a high percentage of people that understand what we're doing and are, I don't want to say taking advantage in a negative way, but they're taking advantage of the opportunity presented to them. So that is happening. And that, to my original point, asking that question, I know we staff don't speculate whether or not somebody is using the system, but if staff are closer to the temperature of 
how residents are utilizing these services or these uh, leniencies that we're applying to services in order to help inform the council so we can make a determination as to whether or not we did this with good intentions as a council to try and afford benefits to residents who may be enduring hardship during a pandemic and it turned out that um, it was useful or it turned out that people took advantage of it or or we we perceive it as being taken advantage of and so what, what we needed to know is if we if you feel if staff feels that this was effective and it should continue to stay effective or if if the council does need to evaluate reinstituting the policies as they used to be or if the council needs to reevaluate the policies and have a new normal for our policies when it comes to water and and what our tolerances are for for delinquent payments and what our process is to respond to those delinquencies so uh, if there aren't any other questions if there are i'm happy to open the floor or keep it open one other comment uh, I want to support uh, what Alderman Snoika said regarding the uh, not taking any action as far as uh, as far as this until we can get the payment processes all worked out for that electronic payment because I do know from my number one constituent uh, <laughs> my wife that she has been frustrated as hell trying to pay the water bill sometimes and just doing a you know, an electronic payment from our bank mm -hmm. and it not working. So uh, people who are work working full time and all that, it is very difficult to get in to talk to somebody during our working hours. So I would like to see that issue resolved before we actually decide to uh, uh, reinstate anything because that was a very good point that she made. Okay. And then Alderman Veneziano, then O'Brien. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I, I appreciate that, and I think all of our residents do. We've all kind of had a struggle, especially those first couple months. Um, but I'm going to challenge you on this question. We all have mortgage payments. We all pay them electronic tr electronically for the most part. And if it doesn't work and it doesn't go through, you will make time to make sure you make your mortgage payment somehow, some way. So I challenge you in the fact that what is any different from making your mortgage payment or your credit card to your water bill? you find time to call and make your payment if you're having trouble online. So why as a city should we take those fees and not be able to retain some of our fees to offset other costs, just like mortgage companies, credit card companies, brokers, lenders, all of those kind of things. I just challenge you in that, that if there's a will, there's a way. You've gotta make the time. If our system isn't working properly, I couldn't They're get it to it. work either. I, I dropped the check in the front of the box. No. There's ways. Yeah. There's absolutely ways. So we as a city shouldn't be eating the cost or not getting these fees because um, technology isn't always user friendly. That's just the way of the world. That's it. Thank you. Alderman I was just going to ask to clarify. I'm not, I'm not opposed to that by any means. We want to have the tools working and those other avenues. But we're do, Alderman, or Alderman Sonoik, I guess it's more for you because I know Alderman Massessi agree with you and I'm not opposed. Are you talking about rein, not reinstating the late fees until we know Tyler's working 100% or are you talking about not reinstating payments at all? I was taken as not doing late fees yeah. until Tyler was up. Is that what you Is that what you were recommending? Is that we still start the collection again, we just don't have late fees? That was my understanding. May I clarify, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yes, I, w I would say that it sounds like staff, in answering these questions from January, uncovered additional issues which they presented here tonight. Right. So, and some of those are some people just may not even know that they should be paying their water bill. Right. And if that's where we are, then that's not, then the discussion is not about shutoffs. The discussion is about making sure all of the residential and commercial households have an account with the city. So that's just an operations issue. Right. And so I'm stating, I'm saying I don't think there should be any policy change at this point until we have our operation uh, questions completely answered and staff understands why we don't have accounts for every single owner, right? Um, and as a part of that, I'm hoping that we can con continue to ensure that we start um, having all of our delinquent accounts paid up and part of that is going to be outreach from, from staff, I would imagine, and any other strategies that, that um, staff comes up with in order to start paying down that balance. Some of it's adjudication, like with our number one uh, account on here, delinquent account on here. Um, and I would state that while we're doing that, I would hope staff would come back, and then we can discuss if we want to implement late fees going forward. At this point, I would say it doesn't make sense to include late fees. Okay. 
I, was, I, I disagree on that part. I'm for not assessing late fees, but I do think, I mean, there's multiple ways to pay. It's 3.7%, so that means 97% of people are finding a way to pay their water bill. But I'm in complete agreement. Waive late fees or any things like that, the penalty fees, I guess. And I'd even be happy going through the end of the year if it's going to take staff four months to review because those are very valid questions that came to light tonight. But I think we've got to start collecting water payments and late fees. I'm comfortable delaying, but yeah. I think we've got to start getting payments and for 97 percent of the other people are figuring out <laughs> so to, to this point th this conversation arose because uh, one timing back in january but two it was brought to the council's attention that because we had established this freeze um staff was no longer tracking or monitoring the inbound payments of our water utility and and that's a critical component that that we need to keep eyes on which i, I believe we have staff now monitoring and staying on top of it um so to that point, though, I think it's important that we reinstitute um, collection of, of of water bills and tardy. Agreed. Yes. But we we should waive late fees, and so I think the yes. council we we should take some votes on that. And so I don't know if it answers the full question about reinstituting the city's original policies, or if this is a, a hybrid amalgam of of a new age for this at the time that we're discussing it sure. now. Sure. I I have a few questions, but yeah. as you guys answer the basic questions uh, if I have follow-up ones I'll, I'll just clarify those after so a quick show of hands for all the council members who believe we should reinstitute um, our policies on collecting water waiving late fees and delinquencies, and delinquencies. Any penalties yeah. things like that anything um, that's detrimental to the resident or the business owner in terms of trying to play catch up in total further date that we'll talk about again we'll yep. have to yeah. we'll have to get more data we'll have to have a closer view from staff on the process and how it's going and then we can revisit this i have the count it's you it was unanimous thank you may I ask a question just for clarity yeah um so as far as the data that's sought is it just affirmation to the council at a future date that the online bill pay system is working as it's been set up and intended to run yeah first step is confirmation that our system is working in the manner it's supposed to and then from that system being able to understand who's who's outstanding what amounts is that what we're looking for alderman Snark, i don't want to put words in your mouth but i yes so the calls that i have received and it sounds like um mrs Bassesi yeah. has also <laughs> received is that utilizing that system for some reason there are certain failures and so i think the council will need to know what some of it maybe our tech tickets are outstanding as to why that's not working or if the finance department has any calls from individuals um, and then basically to just kind of clean up the bugs with the system and so for staffs from staff's perspective what other questions do you need so answers to from the council for direction yeah I, I think the only thing as I recall the only question I believe I had uh, you had talked about I, I know we want to come back um, related well a couple things the first thing is clarification anyone delinquent currently for whatever fees uh, with the exception of penalty or late fees we are not waiving those slates clean we are collecting those at some point in the future yes, yes. okay that that's good the other thing is the reinstituting of penalty fees is that do we want to wait for that information or is that something we could say we're going to reinstitute those on like say january 1st or i only ask because it would be probably helpful for how we provide residents information mm -hmm. in the future and would likely encourage people to want to pay sooner if they knew there's a date out there that a penalty fee may be implemented yeah. I don't expect the problems, any, any problems that you're hearing about from the ERP are going to be uh, long lasting or things that can't be fixed relatively quickly. The utility billing component of ERP is one of the port parts of the system that seemed to be working well. Um, I don't use it as much as uh, your residents, but um, that, that's the only kind of follow up I was going to have is, is there a day down in the future you're thinking about? So for for reinstituting the penalties at this point I mean I'm sure the council we can come up with something but the reality is it would be a superficial and albeit arbitrary date it's a good horizon in terms of communication points so you can 
communicate to the individual or the business owner that by this date, if you're not square, you will start receiving a penalty of X percent or what have you. But it would be a very superficial date on our part. So I think we would have to, I mean, what, what would it take from a staff's perspective in terms of resource hours and being able to ramp up to, to having the diligence to stay on top of those late fees and penalties? Is, that, is there some cost to staff time for any of this? That we'd no, have to not, not that I can imagine. It's, it's part of the regular billing process within within our finance department. So yeah. resumption, essentially, w whichever direction the council ultimately chooses to go in, we can resume the, the billing and, and late penalty uh, billing process. Um, we've just held on that for now. And, and, and we can use in our, our information kind of a, a vague, it, it does help, though, to have that to say, you know, it is our understanding that council is going to consider penalty fee reinstating penalty fees after the first of the year. Mm -hmm. that, that that's not definitive, but it gives some guidance. So, I, I, that's all I was looking for. And if you yeah. don't have that right now, we're okay. I just was trying to avoid bringing this back again. No, I, I, I get it. And I understand. Yeah. We it it helps to have dates, and it helps so we can we know we're tracking in the right direction. Um, and I'm happy to throw out some some dates sure. and have the council agree. Um, I just I don't know if there's any value to the date other than for the sake of communicating to residents that this sure. is this is your deadline and it's used as and I don't want to use the word threat but it's an indicator of when they can start seeing penalties if they don't catch up. Yeah. And that was my only intent. So if the council doesn't feel comfortable, I'm fine with that. I don't want to make that decision for the council, but Alderman Snoy can have something to say, and then we can throw out dates if you think there's a good benchmark date, then we'll use it. Um, and, and the reason that I didn't want to put a date out here is because if some of those issues that we've identified with the ERP system require a longer time, so if I were to say maybe, you know, if this is, can be cleared up in six months, add another three months for any delays into that, so that would be your January 1st date. But this wouldn't include those that are on payment plans, is that correct? Because we're just working on getting the payments for those yeah. that are on payment plans. Yeah, my expectation is if somebody's worked on a payment plan, mm -hmm. then we're not issuing uh, late fees unless they're missing their payments, you know, that they've set up. Mm -hmm. I, I guess, you know, if I agree to pay $50 a month and I don't pay one month, then yeah, that that I think would incur a penalty fee. So that's the kind of discussion I feel like we would need to, to talk about because I don't think we're in agreement as a council to that because if we have somebody who's already struggling to pay and they're on a payment plan and they've discussed this with the city, then they're struggling to make payments. And so we want to ultimately get, a, get that back and if there's a penalty on top of that and they're already struggling, it just seems counterintuitive to getting what we need. So if that's the policy that we have, that would be something to probably change in the future. So I would say we can probably, you know, work on that January 1st date that you've requested um, to give staff enough time to work with the ERP, to work with our data, and then also to communicate with residents that this is coming and then see where we're at much closer to that date. And if we have to adjust and come back, then we do. And I think that would be a great idea, too, because that would then hopefully we'll have a new finance director uh, permanent and that will give them a great opportunity to bring that to the council before before January 1st to kind of talk about where we are with some of those things and yeah it's not my desire that we start penalizing a bunch of people who are especially struggling um, it, but the date will help us I think get some of those accounts made whole so. Yeah, and then I think we, we can take a show of hands for a, a January 1st just so that way it's a communication tool in, in the process for residents from the accounting department and to enable <coughs> folks to get back on track and at least have some sort of bookend to, to where they could be and we can always be flexible as time moves on if we need to be. But Alderman Veneziano and then O'Brien, you had your hands up. So my, I was before you said January. So my proposal was going to be September. So remember, like with collecting absolutely no <coughs> late fees, we are collecting none of these fees that finance has d like laid out for us here. Um, and some of the people that we have delinquent now, they may get caught up, but there's going to be new people. We've now had this cow meeting. They know that there's a flaw in our system. They could take advantage <coughs> of the flaw and will not be penalized with any late fees. So my proposal is going to be September 1st. We could then have three months of collecting some late fees. And that would be for people that have no payment plan, have made no contact with the city to do anything, and any new late delinquent counts starting September 1st. That gives the city 
six months to work out any kinks with Tyler as well. Okay, let's, let's contemplate that. Alderman O'Brien, then we'll circle back to it. Similar, maybe, because we're sitting on the, I was gonna <laughs> say October 1st, it gets us that's fourth quarter. And then we put in there, hey, starting January 1st, you're gonna, I mean, we're like, that gives plenty of time. I was just gonna go off a quarter basis because okay, that's how my too. mind worked. <laughs> I was thinking October 1st. Because then it's fine. fourth quarter, yep. we're back to where we intend to be. Alderman Budmatz? Could we um, put this on the September cow and then we'll yeah. just, we'll, at that point, we'll find out if our collection agent, our collection actions have been successful or not, and then we can make a decision based on real-time um, data and move forward at that point. If, if it's okay, if, if you're pushing it out to a cow, uh, I'm just thinking as the person preparing the information, it may be better for the August cow, which will be middle of the month. That way, if you guys wanted a September date, we could implement it. So, uh, w I would, that would be fine with me. But city manager will make that decision. Yeah, that that should be sufficient. I, I can tell you right now that you know we'll be getting on top of the Tyler payment issue okay. immediately. So um, now that that's been put on the table, we'll we'll try to expedite that pro correcting whatever issues may exist. Okay, so then at this point in time, we're, we're going to push this off to the uh, August meeting and not take any, I know there's no official action in the committee of the whole anyway, but we're just going to push this off to the August, mid-August meeting before we make definitive action or are we reinstituting reinst our policies by straw vote here to bring it back before the council um, at an upcoming city council meeting because that's where it ultimately has to go back to, right? And that was my intent. That was what I was thinking on, too, is that we had, I think it was unanimous, that we have to start going back to what we were at, and the discussion was when we start incurring late penalties. Correct. So I'd like to see it at, I know it's probably not next week's council meeting, but maybe the April one, where we start collecting payment for these again. So that's what that was what I thought was, is we had a unanimous decision to move forward on that. The discussion for later in the year was when we were going to start putting in penalties, and this could be the, the incentive. Ex Exactly. Hey, coming fourth quarter type thing, the city may institute penalties, but we want you to start paying by June first. Yeah, because it was a yeah, unanimous was show unanimous. of hands that we're reinstituting our policies. We're just not implementing any penalties or late fees. Right. So the the component that will come back in August are the discussion about late fees and penalties. Right. And yeah. staff can use that October first end of September date, you know, just and as the your occupancy deadline. or the business license non renewal, Correct. that type of stuff. I thought those yeah. were great ideas for all of them Veneciano and all of them Bud Mats, but that's the all but we want to start collecting again in June if we can. Yes. So yeah. that means that we have to come before the city council at upcoming meetings about reinstituting this this policy yeah. of, of collecting payment. So so two things about that and you might I, uh, the city attorney might need to speak on this. I don't recall that we took an action to approve this under resolution. It was direction given at a meeting. It really wasn't a resolution. So I, you know, unless the city attorney tells me otherwise, I don't think we have to do that. Go to city council to reinstate a policy decision. Correct. That's good. We would, we would the council would act the way they did. So if there was no official action via city council approval and it was just a consensus, the consensus can be provided to staff in order to um, effectuate whatever policy wants to, uh, you know, currently to be implemented. So that's eff it's effective essentially now after the straw vote then going forward, no and upcoming council action. And then per the finance director's request, we would ask to begin reinstituting per your direction with no penalty fees, no late fees, beginning in two months. So April 1st, June 1st, we would start that process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think we, uh, I can tell you for sure, staff has direction. Um, well, what unless there's any. Alderman Bissessi? No, I'm confused, you, can, you confused me, not hard to do. Um, so we're reinstituting our policies mm -hmm. as of now with mm -hmm. our straw vote. Um, so what's in two months? We're going to start collecting, start collecting money again. That's the time it takes we staff to ramp up here. Oh, it's going to take two months for yes. them to ramp up. We, we need to implement everything and make sure that we notify residents that this is coming. And we okay. need about two months. That was the request of the finance okay. director in the previous memo. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Director Horn. Thank you. And all those in the finance who helped bring this information here so we could move forward. Um, with this discussion. That brings us to our next item here. 
if my computer will catch up with me. And this is still with you, Director Horn. And this is the yeah, uh, water, sorry for this, everybody. <laughs> water infrastructure and the ARPA funding. Yeah, I'm, yeah uh, I will try and go as fast as I can. Um, I we got all night. Yeah, we got all night. <laughs> Be careful what you ask for. Um, so, so again, uh, we've had a lot of conversations about ARPA funds. Um, there's a lot behind this. I kept it short and specific to what we're talking about tonight. I try to give you a little brief, brief background about how we got here. Um, it's amazing. It's been seven years, um, and a lot has happened. Um, so I'm going to try and walk us through that. Um, the city has... Oh, no, that's the PDF. <laughs> it's not the PowerPoint version. So I apologize. All my, all my examples are not going to, like, there's going to be no animations. Oh. Um, oh. Sorry. <laughs> so this was to show you there's three different layers. Basically, the city has over 100 miles of water main that we are responsible for, the city owns. Um, uh, included in that are a lot of other assets related to our water system. Uh, the city, you may or may not know this, the city has four different water pumping stations. They have four different deep wells, which are redundancy systems for if we were, if Jawa was to lose water, we could provide water to our residents, primarily for fire protection, but it is water quality, drinking quality water, so it could be used for all the different household items. Um, we also have uh, six different elevated and underground water storage tanks to make sure we have the right capacity for our system. Um, all these components of our water system cost a lot of money. And um, just doing simple math, two miles of water main cost about, or, or uh, excuse me, one mile of water main costs about $2 million. So just in pipe, you have over $200 million in assets that the city owns. Um, these are our assets and therefore they're things we have to um, maintain and we're responsible for. Um, uh, water, main, water main life expectancy. So regardless of the type of material, for the most part, water main that is used, or piping that's used for water main generally has a life expectancy of 50 years for planning purposes. Finding out now that the general life expectancy is closer to 70, but at 70, it's generally at failure. So it's not lasting at all. You will notice that 75% of the city system was built before 1980, uh, before 1990, excuse me, in the 1980s or earlier. Um, water main breaks are a good reflection of the condition of your system. This is a graph that was provided by, uh, I believe it's in your, in your packet, provided by Baxter and Woodman um, in preparation for this meeting. Uh, we basically just took our historical water main breaks um, from 2012. Uh, these are water main breaks. So we have about 40 to 60 breaks a year, but those include water services up to the B-Box. These are specifically on the water main. Um, you'll notice the dotted line is a trend line so it, it is increasing over time. So as it, it's just natural that as the pipe gets older, the ground, uh, the, the acidity in the ground starts to eat away at that pipe, it begins to deteriorate over time. So that is a natural thing that we would expect. Uh, excuse me, I'm gonna go back one. The red line is a trend line. Um, the eight, uh, American Water Works Association establishes a trend line of what you would expect um, for a number of breaks in 100 miles, so we're right at that right now. But again, as the years proceed, we expect that that number is going to go higher. I bring up water main breaks because it's a great planning tool for us, and, but it also is an expense to the city. Uh, just looking at this, this takes all of the uh, water main breaks that you saw in the previous graph and plots them out by decade of pipe. So the the, the pipe decade broke um, the. The decade the pipe, the, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not gonna, it's been a late night. So um, there have been 148 breaks on pipe 
installed in the 60s and 50s. We estimated about $7,000 per break. Some are much more expensive, some are less. That's over a million dollars in repair costs just to fix water mains. Not to replace them, just put a Band-Aid on them. Cost over a million dollars. This graph uh, that, we, that is in your um, uh, packet is probably the most telling and, and once I had the engineers explain it to me, um, it really tells a, a great story. Each one of those dots is a year so between 2020 and 2040, it is expected that the city will have 35, 31 miles of water main that will be at or beyond its life expectancy. And that is 70 years, not 50. So um, the, 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 the point behind this or the purpose behind this is to show that the orange dots are if we do nothing. We, did, we don't put any effort into replacing any pipes we're gonna have all of that pipe, um, you know, uh, each year is about a mile and a half of pipe that will be failing. And those water main breaks will come more, uh, will happen more uh, frequent and they will be more uh, severe. Um, another cost that I haven't included in here is water costs. So every drop of water that comes to us from Jawa, we pay for. And that doesn't matter if it flows out into the street, we still pay for that. So, um, um, so to give you a little background, um, that's a little bit about our water system right now. Uh, rolling back to 2015, the city did a water and sewer rate study. The reason we did the, uh, the reason the rate study was done was because that was the fund balance projection. The red line's what we wanted, the blue line was what we were gonna have. So there were uh, two solutions presented um, at that time. Uh, the option that the uh, council chose was to do a slight increase in water rates each year and issue a infrastructure bond. So the first, the first, um, op the first solution was to increase rates. So you'll notice that each year the rates went up, and if you do the math, it's 7%. Every year it went up 7%. Um, that was in an effort to stabilize water rates. Um, expenses were going up, uh, um, 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 failures were occurring, and um, the revenues were uh, not exceeding our expenses. At the same time, uh, the council made a decision in conjunction with the fire stations to issue an infrastructure bond. The reason they did an infrastructure bond is they were able to use it on, on a variety of uses. Um, so the city chose to use it on two, two fire stations and the leftover funding went to water main replacements. So you see a, a big increase in fund balance and then a steady decline. Well, the steady decline is us spending it. Um, we did uh, probably the biggest uh, uh, amount of water main replacement that has been done in the city in many years. Um, we replaced all the water main on Arbor Drive. We replaced the entire subdivision of Waverly, uh, Waverly subdivision near the high school. Um, we replaced all the water main on Plum Grove Drive and on South Street here in, uh, on the east side of town. Um, so we had a great about two and a half year capital program where we replaced a ton of water main. But what you see now is that that fund balance is back down to what we want. Well, uh, a conversation for another day when we get into the weeds about financing, you will see that when we project out from now five years, by the end of the, by the fifth year, we are again below fund balance policy. Um, and, and that is because the cost of everything is going up and our, our rates have not been increased in three years. I think three, 2019 was the last year we increased the rate. So, um, so I just tell you that because um, uh, there, there is something we are going to have to do as a, as, a, as a community to invest more money into our water infrastructure. Excuse me. Um, 
this was going to be a really cool <laughs> item, but it's not now. Um, so uh, the other thing that happened in 2014, the city joined the GIS consortium. You remember the water rate study was done in 2015. So when we, as Public Works, worked with the consultant and the finance department to, to establish our water rate study, the work we did on the capital plan at that time was to right size the projects, basically to determine the projects we actually really planned to do because it used to be used as a placeholder, and to make sure the funding levels were balanced year over year. That's all we did. We didn't assess need because we didn't even have a GIS system to be able to evaluate that. So now we have this tool we're able to evaluate our system. There's a snapshot of, of the community just to the west, uh, east of us. You'll see all those pink dots. Those are all water main breaks. We can use that as a factor. We also have a tool. These are actually two separate screens, but um, what you can do, and I wish I could walk up there, but there are, there are different criterias we can establish. So ultimately, we can weed out all the water main and just find the worst of the worst. So what is highlighted there is I only wanted to see water main that was cast iron and was four inch or six inch because when it's cast iron, I know it's the oldest kind of pipe. So that helps me identify kind of a, uh, and, and, and help me fund my uh, a worst, to fir uh, worst is first philosophy for replacement. So we can take care of our worst areas because we have the data kind of driving those decisions. Um, I, I bring that up because to establish a GIS system who had, I mean, our guys, when I started here up till about mid 2016, would not throw away their paper maps. So they were using their paper maps as far as early as 2016, mid 2016. I'm very, pleased to say our guys have long thrown those away and they are blowing everybody out of the water with how to use this and how to uh, use this to collect data, to store data, to evaluate systems. They're, they're a cut above everybody else in the consortium as far as how they're using this data. So um, the idea is we now have the ability to plan a long-term program to actually do an annual replacement program very much like we do our street resurfacing program which to the best of my knowledge has not been done historically here. We've been more reactive. You know, an area will find a bunch of water main breaks in an area and will plan to do it and then not plan to do something for five years after. So um, that's one of the reasons we're here. Uh, this is just to show we do have water main replacement projects in our program, but again, we're budgeting less than $500,000 every year. And $500,000 doesn't even get you a half of a mile of pipe. Um, so understanding the proper funding level. This is an estimate done by consulting engineer with very minimal time to talk to them about what our needs are versus what our, um, not what our needs are, versus what our capability of spending is versus how we fund it, whether it be by, by bonding or whatever the different scenarios are. But based on our current system, the information that we currently have that was uh, generated through the water modeling and the, the rate study, the engineer is projecting that we need to be replacing one and a half miles of pipe, which equals about, <coughs> excuse me, two and three quarter million dollars per year. And that gets us to that blue line, which is much more manageable, um, a much more manageable program and much uh, uh, provides much less interruption to service due to water main breaks. And you know, much like a, you know, a police department fleet or a fire department fleet, you don't buy all your vehicles in the same year because when they all are getting old and having to be retired, you don't want to have to replace them all in the same year. And this, this program would propose just taking little bites of the apple and getting us into a more manageable program. 
So I'm sorry, I went fast. I think that's where I was. Um, so, <laughs> so I I I know it's a serious issue. I understand that there's a, a big component of funding discussion for long term. Um, and the reason I put the keep calm is we are no different than a lot of communities in the area. We are not unique in this. Um, however, if you looked at the map that I provided in your, in your packet, the red piping on that map are, is pipe that currently is over 50 years old. And if we don't put together a plan that looks at an annual replacement every year, whether, we, whether it's, a, as you indicated, with some long-term bonding, whether there's a fee assessed, or whatever other funding strategies that we talk about in the future, that needs to be considered. Um, and, and the whole reason I'm bringing it tonight is we have to start reporting on how we're using the ARPA funds. I understand there's a desire to use it for other things. I understand that, appreciate it, and, and, and I'm not opposed to it. I just want the council to understand the situation with the water main. So because it is um, permitted to be used on water main replacement, being able to use this money and other funding that we have available to us over the next couple years may help us build that plan and not lose time in, in the process. So that's why I'm bringing it to you today is really from that perspective. Um, to just put it in your mind that it may be a good idea to use at least a percentage of it on our utilities. So I'm done. Questions? Thank you, Director Horn. The best I could, Mayor. I'm yeah. sorry. We're moving it along. Okay. Uh, any questions for Director Horn on this? If the only one, Brian. No, I was just going to say thanks for that. I think this is a great example. I mean, even ratcheting it back to. It's at failure at 70 years, and we've got, I just took it back one more decade, saying, like, going to the 56s, that, that's roughly 70%. When you add in that 80s decade, that's when we get to So 70% of our infrastructure underneath the streets are at the near failure point. So I think this certainly highlights a, a valid concern we have to think about. Yeah, appreciate that. And as I mentioned back in February, on, on the time when I did receive another notice of, of grants, the Department of Transportation put out $1.5 billion that we can ap apply for these grants specifically sure. for water mains. And so, yes, we can look at aspects of the ARPA funding, but there are many a conduit of resources for funding to help us with this as well, which I know you're looking into. Yeah, we have the whole uh, build, build a better America or build, build, build America. back better. Build back. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have that whole packet. Um, I, again, you know, certainly we want to take a, as many opportunities as we can in that regard. The, the, the only concern I have regarding that is it, it, they haven't released the money yet. <laughs> they just, they're telling us all the things that we can apply for and it really still hasn't been approved. And my, f I, I don't want to hang our hat on what could be, and then miss an opportunity. And and again, I, I'm, this is this problem took 70 years to occur. It's not going to be fixed in 10 years. It's a, a you know we will long be retired, and all new councils and all new staffs will be handling this problem for years to come. My goal is to get us on the right trajectory to start planning accordingly, build a program that people in the future can build off of. And just one more point about the, the Department of Transportation and the RAISE grant, that, that is accepting applications uh, up until April 14th. So we have about a month left for that. Um, and I hope we're staying on top of these. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Can Alderman I just Ryan? ask one thing to clarify, Director Horn? The because the number the other number that really jumped out at me were the 148 band aids we put on to the tune of like 1.1 million. What was that year? And I might have missed it in your slide. Was that over the last 10 years? Because I know the pipes burst were from 50s and 60s, but that was another light bulb that I wanted for me. If the estimates are 2.75 a year for the next several years, but we're spending 1.1 million every two years to put band aids on it. It, it's a 10, it's ten, a ten year, year okay. span that was 2012 to 2022. It's actually more like nine years. Okay. But, but again, we also only counted the breaks on the main. So for example, uh, there's a pipe called Transite that was put in after cans, cast iron was eliminated. And because of the material, 
it erodes where the service connects to the main and that pops off because it erodes well we don't count that as a water main break okay that's a service break okay. so it, the the dollar amount for those actually could kind of go up but okay. I mean those are things you're never going to get away from right. unless you know you were established in the 80 I mean, well, now 2000s but we're all all these communities older Cook County communities all have older water main put in in the where the majority of them were built between the 50s and the 70s and that that's just a reality um, quite honestly this is a program that we should have been talking about 25 years sure. ago but we didn't and it's okay I mean but but the idea is when I said keep calm and question mark <laughs> we can keep calm and plan for the future or we can keep calm and bury our head in the sand and hope it gets handled by future councils or future right. staffs and I, I, I would discourage that move. Perfect. And so as far as next steps, so this will come back to the council and I think our staff will begin working on a plan that will get incorporated with our capital planning uh, process as well as budgeting. With respect to the ARPA component of this discussion, we'll come back with a recommendation to the city council on how we handle the ARPA breakdowns. As Director Horn mentioned, we are coming up on a timeline where we are required to report how we utilize that ARPA funds that have been distributed and will be distributed to the municipality. So we'll certainly come back to the council with a recommendation, but we did want to bring this to your attention and just make the council aware that investment into our, our water infrastructure is something that we're looking at heavily and the ARPA funds are a good opportunity to be a kickstart into that. Thank you, Manager Sabo. Any other questions on, on this this update, this presentation? If not, then we're gonna move forward thank to, you. I think, thank you, Director Horn. We're gonna move on to our, our sixth and final item, which is the personnel rules and regulations for the city of Rolling Meadows. As the council knows, this was postponed uh, from late last year until we had our city manager settle in and have exposure um, to this documentation. And one of the initial reasons I wanted to see this come before the council, um, the first aspect is that the council should be reviewing this annually in conjunction with the city manager. And as, as we go through the year and we uh, approve ordinances and make decisions as a council, each of those are a single snapshot and it's a piece to the puzzle. And then when we're able to look at the personnel rules and regulations collectively or comprehensively, then we get to see as a whole picture of what we've just made decisions on and how that impacts either staff or the operations as a whole. And so Manager Sabo has had now three months about, not, not really, but mm -hmm. to, to settle in and uh, begin examining this. And so from this point forward, I'll, I'll let you take it from here and see what you've discovered. Sure. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that, Mayor, and I, I appreciate the, uh, the uh, introduction. So um, as the council's aware, I'm, I'm a newcomer to the organization. So I had an opportunity to take a look at this from an outsider coming in. And just like many of you, I'm sure have experienced it is not an easy document to read. Much of that has to do with the fact that there have been a number of ordinances that were passed that amended the rules and regulations over the course of years. They weren't necessarily written into the actual document itself. They were appended to the beginning. Um, at this point, this document is about 15 and a half years old uh, from when it was originally debuted by the city. Um, as the mayor indicated, you know, I, I did spend an, a, a quite a bit of time going through it. All of these notes and red post-its and all of these things are all different items that I've identified as needing a bit of a closer look. Um, whether that be ensuring that the uh, provisions included within here align with current laws as set forth by FLSA, um, FMLA, all of the different federal uh, laws that exist that pertain to employment. Um, some of them I'd, I'd need to run past our, our city attorney just to make sure that they are aligned with current law. Um, and others, it's just a matter of making sure that this policy manual aligns with the way that we are currently structured. Um, you know, it, it reflects our current uh, collective bargaining environment, et cetera. Um, to that extent as well, I know that the council previously, um, back when this item was postponed, had an ordinance that was proposed that included um, elimination of certain provisions from within the manual. And I did include those in my staff report that's in the agenda this evening. So um, in my review of that, I, I have had an opportunity to discuss it a bit with, with our team. And if that's something that the council desires to move forward on, um, we certainly can bring that ordinance back for the city council to consider. Um, the f document update, my goal is to bring this back to the city council this year, um, revised and it be the personal rules and regulations of 2022 
moving forward in the way that we amend the document, it would be my goal to make those revisions within the document with footnotes that identify when amendments were made. Um, I think that as a user um, and as, you know, for the public's use, it, it just makes the document significantly easier to read. Um, all, those being s all those things considered, um, this document does govern um, the rules and regulations for positions that are not collectively bargained. Um, these are typically your management and supervisory staff as well as uh, certain specified uh, positions who are, uh, for example, executive assistants. And so the, the document itself does outline a number of different components from paid time off to um, employee conduct, uh, sexual harassment, et cetera. It is all encompassing. Um, it's my goal as I mentioned, to come back to the council with some recommendations as far as updates, um, potential revisions, and, and just to modernize and make sure that the, the document itself does align um, with current practices um, and also does make sure that it, we do provide a competitive uh, working environment uh, that will not only retain our existing employees but also be an attractive uh, employment location for individuals looking to come and join us. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Like I said, there, there are a number of, of components in here that I've identified through my research um, being that you know I'm, I'm into my third month here there, this amongst the many other projects and tasks along with getting to know the organization there's there's been quite a bit of work I've been doing but nonetheless um, I wanted to bring to the council and, and make everyone aware that I have been working through this and sharing occasional updates with the mayor as well of, of things that I've, I've observed and, and noted thank you for that manager Sabo and, and we do expect it to be a continued conversation and the I think the, the collaborative nature of, of yourself, your observations, and the council enabling city and staff to operate efficiently and be reflective of, of a modern organization, one that, that balances both the, the privileges and the rights of the employees and creates an environment of satisfaction, but also more importantly, because we're preoccupied in our, our day jobs and so we come to city council meetings and there's ordinances that, that we pass as a city council and at the time over the weekend we review them, we make decisions based on staff recommendation, but when the year passes, we, we I personally speaking only, we, I don't see the full picture of what we've done in terms of our impact to the city operationally, organizationally, but as our obligation to review this handbook as a council should be done every year, it will help us get a better understanding as to all that we've we've created in terms of policy for those who operate within these confines to operate by honor to and then hopefully make sure that it's it's creating a positive feedback loop that's being experienced out in the community as a result of our actions any questions or comments for manager Sabo no I, I, I look forward to this because I know it's no small feat my only ask is could we get like a red line version when we go through this? Because what I had some angst over and the three parts that were pulled out for us in November to look at seemed like it was dealing with our first responders and public works. And that gave me some angst because I didn't see what was old, what was new, because it is a mess. Let's call it what it is. Yeah. If mm -hmm. we could get a red line version, because I did not have the confidence that I was understanding what was being asked of us in November, so I was glad it was pulled, because it seemed to be dealing with, obviously, police, fire, and public works, everybody that makes the city yeah. run. So if we could get some type of red line version. I don't need to see your comments to your internal review, sure. but just a red line version of what we're actually looking at changing, I'd feel more comfortable with that. So one of the biggest things is allowing Manager Sabo time to actually settle into his role and then have the bandwidth to review this document as a living breathing document yep. and whether or not it's being reflected experientially in the confines of the operation or it's a document that's stood alone and it's it's just been created in in an exercise of creation and not necessarily uh, benefiting the organization or manager Sabo in his capacity. So we'll, we'll revisit this as, as you get to settle in and dig into this deeper, but mm -hmm. absolutely have some sort of legacy and red line so we can understand what we're looking at, what it was to right. what it's evolved <laughs> into. Absolutely. It was like, what's better, better one or better two, like the eye doctor, and I was having a hard time looking at what the changes actually were yeah I, I, certainly this will come back as I w one of the things I, I have the word file for this now so 
it's just a matter of putting track changes in there and beginning. Time to find the word it, it was somewhere dug. <laughs> I had to dig into it, but I found it. So I, I will provide all of the red lines as far as things that Perfect. get updated. And you know, it, it, given the volume and how much information it may be, you know, as as things are are updated, it may come back to you in, in portions. There may be some reorganization of how the chapters are laid out. But nonetheless, you know, certainly it'll be a before and after picture for the council, Perfect. so you have an educated decision making process. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Alderman Veneziano? Thank you. So it's late, but um, to recollect that this kind of brought, got brought up to our attention because we were questioning vacation carryover. Am I correct? Is this? No, no, no. I know oh, that. Oh, oh, oh. But this entire document and how it kind of got brought up to us and what our policy was. And so. Mm -hmm. Not to my knowledge, not to my recollection. Okay. No. See, I told you it was late. And what our policy, uh, Attorney Wolf, maybe you can help us, that we were questioning um, because we had to do a payout for vacation time. And so we were questioning what was the policy yes. in severance. Yeah. And that's how this got brought up, correct? It's not, not specific to policy. So what happened was over the summer we were dealing with separations. Yep. And those separations uh, had financial components attached to them. And we were trying to understand how the financial levels accumulated to what they were and the expectation that they be distributed. And it was brought to our attention as a city council that we should be reviewing this policy, this handbook annually in conjunction with the budget, not approving the budget and the handbook just getting slid into the budget as an de facto XO. Okay, it, it fits because you approved the budget. So now the handbook automatically flies mm -hmm. by. But these two things should be standalone and separate and examined by the council. So that way we understand how they make sense. Attorney Wolf, you have more or different to add. You're more than welcome to. Just, uh, uh, just more specificity to it. So it, it, um, it was really related to the pay plan that's mm -hmm. identified in the handbook. And that is something that the council had to review annually. And, um, and that wasn't occurring outside of just a review of the overall budget approval. So that's, that's why this issue was brought to light. In okay. addition, because of the certain separations, um, there were some recommendations regarding um, provisions in those types of agreements that could go in a personnel handbook. Um, and uh, those changes can be part of the overall comprehensive review uh, of the personal manual um, that the manager does now. And, and to that effect, and I've had the conversation with Mayor Gallo about the pay plan itself, um, customarily communities will put together a resolution that's brought to the council as part of that budgetary process annually where the compensation plan for the city is approved and that outlines the pay scales as well as the compensation, the different steps and levels. Some of those are collectively bargained, as I said before, so they're stipulated within those types of union agreements. Others, as are non-collectively bargained and governed by the rules and regs, are identified as well. So that's something that I'm, I'm going to be working with our team to put together and that'll come back to the council as part of the budgeting process. Hey, that answered my question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was a long way of answering my question because I, I, I know it's late, but I was re remembering that we had to review something before our next budget. I couldn't remember exactly what it was and I knew you need time to review this entire document and make revisions, but there was something that we needed to review as a council with the budget. So thank you. That's, mm -hmm. you answered exactly it. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Good. Happy to hear. Any Together, anybody it. else have any questions, comments? If not, it's been a long evening. Thank you all for for sticking with us on this. But I look for a motion to adjourn. Everybody, that's unanimous. All those in favor, I'll say aye. 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 Those opposed, the ayes have it. This meeting is adjourned. Good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs> it's not a long it's a